You took the words right out of my mouth. See you later, everybody. <laughs> Just kidding. We are on episode 0016 of A Review to a Kill, our podcast series about the James Bond franchise. Coming to you from fanboysanonymous.com. It's time for another episode of the Bond cast. I am Tony Mango, your host, and my other hosts, you should know them by now, I've got with me Callum Wiggins. Are you really Colombian? <laughs> <laughs> And Robert D. Felice. Well, there goes mine. Uh, this was legitimately the most dangerous bond ever. Living <laughs> on the edge. Oh, if, uh, if you don't know by now, we are talking about License to Kill. Uh, this is one of the most controversial Bond films. It is one of my absolute favorite Bond films. It's one that people seem to love or hate in a lot of different ways. And we're going to break down everything from top to bottom, left and right, side to side, diagonals, and all the other kind of angles that we normally do here. And we invite you to do the same thing. Drop a comment below. Tell us your thoughts on License to Kill, your thoughts on our thoughts on License to Kill, and everything else that's going on here. If you're enjoying this podcast and you're thinking of a way to just say, bless your heart to us, then there's a lot of ways that you could do that. Hitting the like button on YouTube, sharing this on social media, subscribing on the channel if you haven't done that already, and uh, following us on Facebook and Twitter. You can help the channel grow and the website grow as well by uh, hitting up the Patreon, patreon.com slash fanboys anonymous. You can hit the join button on YouTube. You can uh, support us through the merchandise shops on TeePublic and Redbubble. Lots of different ways for you to show us that you're a fan of everything that we've got going on here. I know that uh, I'm enjoying the hell out of this. Uh, I'm hoping that everybody else is as well. And, yeah, I guess we're just going to kind of get things um, started here, talk about the things we normally do. We're going to talk about the foreign language titles first, and unfortunately, despite the fact that The Living Daylights had like a million of these that were so good, uh, not a whole lot on this side of things. A lot of them were just variations of License to Kill. Um, the only ones that really stood out to me were on like the more bland side than anything else. Uh, Italy has Private Revenge. Which is just like, eh. yeah. Um, Japan seems very boring. It's the canceled license. It just seems like it's a DMV issue. Sweden has time for revenge. Oh, and the DMV would be a good time. Yeah. Uh, Hungary has the lonely agent, which seems kind of sad. But my favorite one is Taiwan. They just were like, screw it. It's homicide license. Yes. <laughs> Homicide license is great. The taglines are his bad side is a dangerous place to be. James Bond is out on his own and out for revenge. Accurate. Uh, out for revenge glimpsed behind the cool facade of 007 and uh, glimpsed behind the, the cool facade of 007 and see how sweet revenge can really be. It's a mouthful. It's a lot. Uh, disgraced, dishonored, deadly, to the point. And when Bond wants revenge, nothing stands in his way. Not even, and then in all caps, Her Majesty's Secret Service. <laughs> uh, the original title was going to be License Revoked. And they did some test audience, kind of, uh, you know, like, uh, what do you think about this? And people legitimately were confused, thinking that it was his driver's license. So that's why they made it License to Kill. <laughs> Imagine that. An entire movie about Bond waiting in the DMV and being like, I lost my driver's license. And people being like, can you fill out Form 7A? And then stand in this line instead. <laughs> and Bond could just be you like, oh, just piss off. And... Below 7A. Ah, yeah. Well, then it would have been like one of those moments where you've got back in like Dr. No and stuff where the Bond theme plays when he's filling out the form, you know? <laughs> He's just like walking around the DMV and it's like, ba -da 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 -da. and he's like, should I do initial here? Or <laughs> okay. Should I write myself down as um, uh, Bond off? <laughs> <Instead>. <laughs> the original idea for this was going to revolve around the Golden Triangle and drug lords in China. And it would have featured a motorcycle chase along the Great Wall of China, which seems like it's going to happen in no time to die. Funny enough. And a 
a fight sequence was going to break out around the terracotta statues and they were going to kind of make this like very Chinese based and China put a bunch of restrictions on it, like veto rights over the script. So they were like, nah, <laughs> just changed it over to that. And of course they were worried about uh, some kind of blowback on whether they went straight up Colombian. So there's that line in the the movie where are are, are you uh, are you Colombian? Where they were just kind of like, let's just say that like that he's not necessarily. Let's make this thing of Isthmus City, and that way nobody can be like really upset with us or whatever. You know, uh, License to Kill is a movie that feels very very different, and it was one of the ones that I am the most excited to hear what you guys have, especially after watching so many fifteen of these other movies or so beforehand um you've you've gotten into the rhythm well past the point of being like okay we know what how the themes are going to go we know how how this is going to play out we know that he's going to have this kind of a line and license to kill is a real big departure it's the first per- pg-13 movie it's got a different composer michael Kamen. it has some different themes to it it's more brutal Callum, what were you thinking when you're getting into License to Kill? So, I was obviously expecting a bit more of a dark side of things because we saw glimpses of that in the Living Daylights. It went further than I imagined it to do. Hmm. But my general feeling coming out of it is that it still left me as cold as the Living Daylights did. I, I don't, I don't bond with this bond. Yeah, bond doesn't. I don't, I don't get this. I don't. This, I don't warm to this bond. This, and, and I know it's the idea that he is obviously a lot more clinical, a lot more violent. I see a lot more of the psychopathic, sociopathic, almost evil tendencies in this bond. Like, again, this is like a weird analogy and it's very, very British, but um, you know how there's been like loads of Doctor Whos? Right. Yeah. And there's this one Doctor Who, I can't remember the name of which one it was exactly. I think it was... Um, uh, Eccleston. I think he might have been the sixth or seventh doctor or something like that, but essentially it's a doctor that's slightly evil. Hmm. It's a doctor that's a bit more just not super lighthearted, is a bit more snarky, a bit more aggressive towards his companions and stuff like that, rather than being like more the friendly go lucky one that you'd expect to see in most Doctor Who characters. And that one is very much a love or hate type of Doctor Who. And uh, Dalton's bond is a very much, at least it comes across to me as a very love or hate bond, and I don't, I don't like it. It, it doesn't work with me. Are you thinking more so that he needs more humor or more charm or more, like what is it that he's that that isn't connecting about that? I know that like the more brutal side is isn't connecting, but it, what's the part that's missing out of that? It's weird because again. I I really gravitate toward Daniel Craig's Bond, and Daniel Craig's Bond is, some would say, even more statistic, if not the same level of sadism as this Bond is. But that Bond seems to, it feels like he has more backstory to him. It feels like he's more rounded as a character. I just don't think Dalton presents any sort of thing beyond just being the character that he is at that moment in time. It's it's a really hard thing to say. I just don't feel whether it is like a lack of charisma or a lack of charm or this weird thing where this bond like does so many is usually so laser focused and he's aggressive and he's forthright and trying to get things done. And then he just bursts out laughing in random <laughs> segments of the movie. and just go like, yeah, you all, what? I, I don't like this bond. And I know there's a lot of things about the idea of the bond character is an arsehole and that's why Tony likes him so much. And I can kind of get that side of it, but this guy seems to be, this is an asshole that you don't want to mess with in any circumstance. <laughs> like, you could be a friend of this guy, and he will do something appalling or atrocious in front of you and just have to, like, uh, okay, yeah, <laughs> nice one, James. That was uh, great. Like, this, yeah, this guy feels like he's more of a loose cannon, and not in a good way, in my mind. This is like if uh, Christian Bale and the whole American Psycho thing, if he would have been cast as Bond kind of a thing. Yeah, or Christian Bale in the set of that whatever the movie it was. <laughs> Terminator the, Salvation. Uh, or the production crew. Good for you! 
yeah, it seems like this could be this bond at any moment in time. And then another time he's just like, oh, just all jokey and laughing and stuff like that. Like, he seems like someone who could be laughing with a friend at one point and then just see a villain out of this corner of his eye, just shoot them through <laughs> the head head in broad daylight and then just go back to laughing, drinking his cocktail <laughs> straight to afterwards. Be, to be fair, as much as I have established that I do like the assholes and a lot of different things and whatever, I think that Christian Bale's rant is great. <laughs> When he's yelling at the lighting guy, I think it's like, yeah, fuck that guy for getting in the way. <laughs> like, you know, kind of, I don't go and walk in front of you. Do, 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 do. And it's like, yeah, you don't. <laughs> like, so, good for you, Deller. Aside from establishing that Tony is a psychopath, is a sociopath. You know, like, Joker's my favorite villain. Batman's my favorite. It's like, you know. I, I really liked this film because I thought it was the most... It was the best told story so far, I thought. I can see what Callum is saying, and even though he really doesn't like it, I think Callum nailed it on the head for what Dalton was going for. Dalton was intent on making this this grizzled guy, all right, if we're going to keep the continuity and say he's been doing this, you know, 16 times around, he's fucking miserable, and he has no you know, handle on his emotions. And I think it can be a little jarring. Like this was definitely jarring. Yeah. <laughs> I I loved it hearing uh, some of your go to uh, first reactions to this. Uh, I'm going to bring up, um, I'm going to bring that up while you're talking, try to read them it's, out. It's like a view to a kill was like a couple movies ago. And it seems like a different franchise entirely. So while I think bond, mastered the action film here it's missing a segment of bond with like that you know he's he's charming he's smooth talking some of that isn't present and i think that's why it's a miss for callum i have it right now ranked very high i wouldn't be surprised to see it slip for other movies that we've already watched as i go back and reassess the franchise as a whole I would say, just as an overarching thing before we obviously get down to details, there are three things about this movie that turn me off more than anything anything else. One is Dalton's Bond, which I've just not gone on board with, and I don't think I will at this point. Uh, the second is it's it's trying desperately, and I think for the most part it succeeds, of getting in a more serious, violent tone. But there are moments of this where it regains its old kooky bondness, and that's more jarring in this movie than at any other point in the series because they are going with a serious tone. And so when something happens, like, I don't know, for instance, a fucking lorry uh, goes up on its hind legs <laughs> and you basically go, yeah, this doesn't work for this movie. It just doesn't work because you, you've established a tone. You can't break that tone. You can't just say, oh, this is a bomb movie. So we should do this thing. It's like, well, no, that means the rest of the movie you've done has, isn't a bomb movie. It's a, but we'll get into that when it goes into it. And the third thing is, there is one major plot point in this movie that got me really, really excited for what, the, and I'll get into it when we get to the part is, that got me really excited for what this movie had in store from that point onwards, and it's seriously under-delivered for me. I agree with you. I think I already know what you're talking about. I'm actually not too sure what you're talking about. Um, so I'll be interested Do you want to spoil in... it now, or do you want me to wait until, we'll wait until we get well, to yeah, it? Yeah, we'll see. Because uh, now I'm, I'm curious, because there might be a couple different things, depending on how it is. Um <clears throat> So Rob's some of Rob's reactions for this were a couple of holy shits. Uh, there's a bro, what the fuck? There's a oh my god, Q kind of thing. Like uh, uh, this movie is one that I hold near and dear. Uh, I I fully understand why a lot of people are turned off by it because there are people that criticize it for being too brutal. Um, there are people that criticize it for being too much of a departure from the way that the series is like, I think it's got all of the elements to it. It's just that it's done in a different way. And normally I'm the type of person who hates that. Like I'm an outlier when it comes to this and some other things, because a lot of other movies, like when we get to like quantum of solace, there's going to be some things that Mark Foster did in that movie. That is a departure. And I hate, uh, to spoil it a little bit, he had this whole idea of like, I want to have uh, 
themes of the elements of nature in the movie. And I'm like, oh, you're just like masturbating yourself, basically. Like that that's not pulling it off all that well. It could have been well, but it it didn't work for me. And this definitely is a movie that they decided that they were like, let's go 80s because Lethal Weapon is out and Die Hard is out. And these movies are very much different from like Octopussy, where in comparison, if you do a movie like an Octopussy, I'm sure people look at Bond and they go, oh, this is like for the kids because I'm watching The Terminator and I'm watching RoboCop and I'm watching – and it's like – if you haven't seen RoboCop in a while, watch the actual cut of RoboCop, not something that's on TV. RoboCop is fucking really brutal. Like, you see the dude get his hand blown off. Some dude gets toxic waste put all over him, and he turns into this weird tumor creature that gets run over, and he explodes in a bit amount of blood. Like, that's the time frame of people being like, no, we want, like, grit so they tried to do that, but then again, they didn't want to go 100% full force. So there are some moments where it's kind of like, let's get back to way that it used to be. And I can totally understand Callum being a little bit less into that. Um, I will fully uh, talk about how much I love a lot of those elements on their own and all that too. So strap yourselves in. We're going to be in for a, a fun ride here. <laughs> uh, the gun barrel, I don't like. Because I think it's jarring. It's just, ah, da, it's like, ah, damn it, you know, kind of a thing. Not a fan of that music. And it's one of the only pieces of musical uh, score in this that I don't like. Um, it's just kind of harsh. I don't know if you guys yeah. remember what that was like. Uh, I'll be honest, I can't really recall what the gun barrel was like as opposed to the rest of the film. So it just didn't hit. Yeah, it didn't strike me as anything remarkably different other than the fact that it goes, but the, the blood comes down and it freezes and then the, the thing moves around a bit. I didn't find it particularly over the top. If uh, if I did a ranking of gun barrels, which I might at some point, something like Golden Eye is my favorite. I, I like the more like let's ease into it kind of things. Whereas this one was like, it, it's like a violin shriek almost kind of just like, bah, oh my God, like it's Bond movie kind of thing. And uh, we have our opening sequence here. Um, we see a plane landing and uh, Michael G. Wilson's cameo in this movie is uh, the guy who says, if they hurry, they might just be able to grab the bastard. That's his whole big part. And uh, Bond's in a tux. He's next to Felix and Sharky. Uh, it's the same Felix that we saw in Live and Let Die, David Hedison, who is 61, I think, in this. But honestly, I don't think he looks all that bad. He looks great. This Felix was a lot better than the last Felix. That I don't even know why they bothered with that version of Felix. Yeah. Well, cast younger than they cast the oldest that they could have cast. <laughs> but it's like at that point, just name it something else. Name him something else. Felix's understudy or his <laughs> assistant or whatever. Felix uh, heavier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the DEA stops them. They say that Fran Sanchez is in the Bahamas. They got the green light to go after him. And Felix is gung ho. He's like, all right, let's go grab him and not go to the wedding. And Bond's going to go with him. And they leave Sharky to be the one that's going to tell Della. Uh, you know, that he's, uh, I'll, I'll be a little bit late for the wedding kind of a thing. Our intro to Sanchez is pretty harsh. Uh, as, as, uh, Rob said in his message to me, he's like, I didn't expect this to start with a spanking. It's, um, Lupe, Lupe Lamora is with some other guy. It's his girl. And he says, what did he promise you? His heart? Give her his heart. So they Cut the fucking dude's heart out. You don't see it, but you know it happens. And Hans, uh, Hans, uh, Hans and Franz, I'm thinking of SNL. Uh, Franz whips her. So a minute into the movie, you're like, oh, fuck this guy. Yeah. Yeah, this, this was jarring. Yeah, I mean, you obviously immediately get to the visualization of him being an awful person, but he wants to cut this dude's heart out for sleeping with his girl. And then, but we don't know the context behind the reason why, but clearly he's a, he's a 
an awful person, so you can kind of sympathize with her straight away. And we get this uh, 80s slow-mo shot of Felix and the DEA agents with their rifles running in front of the helicopter. But da 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 trumpet music kind of thing. That's a moment that I think is pretty, like, you can laugh at it, but I also kind of love it because they were very serious at that time, you know? Uh, Bond is supposed to be strictly an advisor, but naturally he gets involved. He's got this big-ass handgun. Uh, I like the line, are you trying to get yourself killed? Well, if I don't get ba- you back for the wedding, I'm a dead man for sure. That's nice. Yeah. Uh, Sanchez hops in a plane. He's heading to Cuban airspace. He'll be there in a few minutes, but it's just enough time for Bond to be able to uh, spearhead this plan of going fishing, which is a recurring theme in this movie. And he straps himself into the harness from a helicopter. He gets lowered down, straps that onto the, the hooks this cable onto the plane, and they somehow are able to get the plane and they can like drag that along. I don't know how the helicopter can withstand that weight, but okay, sure. I'll go with it. They did it apparently. So it must be a, a thing. Well, my bigger issue is not the fact that the helicopter being able to sustain the weight or not. It's the fact that the helicopter managed to catch up with a fucking airplane. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Maybe yeah, uh, just... Sanchez was doing some uh, loops or something. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's just, it's going by so quickly. It's, I know there are many moments in the Bond franchise, and there's many moments in this movie in particular where the laws of physics are completely broken. But, yeah, there was the first bit of it where I go, okay, this is supposed to be a bit more of a serious movie based on what I've been told and led to believe about it, and now I'm seeing a helicopter outrun a, an actual airplane. Mm-hmm. I just go, yep, not buying it. <laughs> Don't believe it. Uh, Bond and Felix parachute down right into the wedding. Hell of an entrance. I'm sure as fuck not doing that for mine. <laughs> I think about it. <laughs> I'm not a skydiver type, and in my luck, I'd fall. <laughs> you know? You'll be fine. But way to make an entrance for a wedding, though, isn't it? It'd be like, oh, I just caught this international drug dealer, and I'm um, you know, going to parachute down into that and whatever. Very, I actually am cool. a huge, huge fan of this intro. I think, again, going back to what I said about it being the best told story... This plays into the entire movie, and I love that. Like, this is actually an important, you know, opening sequence to watch, or some of them, you know, you, uh, Blofeld is promising stainless steel. <laughs> yeah, Harry delicatessen and, and stainless steel. steel and sometimes Bond's got a duck on his head. <laughs> you know? Yeah, like, this was so good. This really tied the movie together. I do appreciate the fact that it obviously links up to everything else you're going to see in the movie. So I do like the fact that it's not just a standalone little section before the movie starts. I do think it's setting you up, though, for a tone of movie which it doesn't follow through with. I think this is too happy. comedic. Well, yeah, too happy. Too co- well, I'm not even too happy because I'm OK with the idea that because Bond always wins in the opening segment. So that's totally fine with me. But it's too classic bond too comedic to oh we're to helicopter hooking a plane out of the sky type thing and skydiving down at the end of it and then you're basically introduced to a partial horror movie essentially <laughs> in, in part so i don't think it sets the tone properly for what you're going to see going forward see i actually like that because i think that that lures the audience into a false sense of security because they're kind of like oh okay this is going to be like this fun romp like Yo, oh, that bad guy's so bad, like he's whipping his girlfriend and whatever, and then he catches him, and it's like, oh, we're going to have these kind of hijinks. And then once the turn happens, then it becomes, like, it hits you even harder, because you're not expecting it. I guess. Hey, Tony, how how long was it did it take for the Bond franchise to recover from this? Well, we'll get into that. <laughs> but But to be fair, it's not that it's recovering from this. There's actually, like, nine elements that it ended up having an issue with. A lot of people okay. blame it on the movie and like the performance of the movie. It's actually a, a, a deeper, deeper story than that. So we'll we'll round about uh, talk about that at the end of this. Um, let's talk about our main theme. This doesn't get a lot of love, but I'm a huge fan of it. I think it's got the '80s flair right. It's reminiscent of Shirley Bassey. I love the lyrics. You know, I've got a license to kill, and you know I'm going straight for your heart. Got a license to kill anyone who tries to tear us apart. I. I absolutely love this song. It's not my favorite, 
It's not going to be number one. It's not number one ranked right now for me. Um, I currently have it on my list as far as like the running uh, thing is number four. But I know for a fact that some other ones are going to push it even further down. I don't think I ranked this one yet. It's This one for me is different because I've heard takes on this for years because obviously we've talked about the pro wrestling side of things. Uh, Dean Malenko used a variation of this instrumental as his theme song and then that gets turned into Cesaro's theme. So I actually thought this was like a way more prominent Bond theme. I like it. It grew on me after a few listens. But it would mean so much more if this was a Felix Leiter movie and that's the theme song. Because then it plays into the movie with Bond isn't really fighting for love here, so I it kind of misses for me. I found this theme song completely jarring. It was it's I know I've said in our previous episodes where I don't really feel that like there's a set Bond theme style. But if I was to categorically say a Bond song which doesn't fit with all the rest of them, it's this one. Really? I, th- I think it's so miles out of left field, really. The only thing that really cuts together is some like, like of the trumpets and a few of the... <clears throat> but I think the beat is all wrong. I think the tone is completely out of place for the movie that it's supposed to be portraying. I think the backing vocals are ridiculous and over the top. I, I don't as, as a Stone Line song, it's fine, but it just it's so out of place for everything else in the franchise. Even the other ones, which are a bit more like love themed and stuff like that, they have a bit more, I would say, character to them than this. Even like all time high. Yep, I I have wow. that over this as well. I think that um, the only song that I have lower than this, which is an actual song for the theme song, is "The Man with the Golden Gun," because just because I think that that's a bad song. I don't <laughs> think this is a bad song. I don't think this is a bad song, but it's just. Um, but I just don't think it fits within the franchise. Even The Man with the Golden Gun, I think, fits more as a Bond song than this one does. And I think it's Gladys Knight, right, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I think she over... I think she milks it. I think she... she. This is what I would imagine Mariah Carey would sound like doing a Bond song, where hmm. she makes it about herself rather than the song. <laughs> Beautiful analogy. Uh, I, I have some Mariah Carey in my collection. <laughs> I'm not, no, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, but I can see that being the case. Not, again, it, but it's just all that that bit at the start where it's just like, I feel I got to like, all that other stuff. Just Hold like, on no, to you, start, no. yeah. Just like no, just start singing. Like do the actual verses of it. Like all that extra uh, bollocks on top of it. it just doesn't work for me. The visuals are back to being beautiful women and silhouettes and such. Uh, nothing really stands out to me except for the much more blatant nudity that they didn't even bother to try to obscure as much in this one. You know, Playboy model who plays the Hong Kong narcotics agent later in the movie, she's in the opening credits and it's just like, there's her boobs. You know, kind of. Well, we're essentially entering the 90s here, so we're getting, you know, people are getting more accepting towards things like that. It's weird because there's more nudity in this one than any of the ones that we'll see later on. They do a better job of like obscuring it in the future. So it's kind of like, you know, if you're, you know, chalking up another point to the nudity list, like go ahead and check that one out, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, you say like the similar thing. It's pretty much the same as from The Living Daylights. They're just mm-hmm. really devoid of anything interesting or eye catching throughout the entire thing. It just feels like you're just going with the motions and adding to the fact that this song doesn't strike a chord with me as anything positive. It probably has to go to be like the worst credit sequence I've probably seen in the entire franchise so far. I absolutely love the song, but I think that, and I would love to see people do this. If anybody is the type of person who they have the background to do the animations and stuff, I'd like to see some other takes on the visuals for some of these movies. This would be one that I would definitely like to see what somebody else can bring to it. Cause I think you can do, some fire stuff. I think you could do some stuff with sharks in the ocean. I think that you could do, I don't know, like they, they could have had a little bit more fun with it. This is mostly like cameras. Yeah. And if there's there cameras and casinos. Yeah. That's about it. I don't think that that was the right way to go. Uh, let's see that we're on the, the wedding stuff that we got going on here. Um, Sanchez is facing 936 years in prison. <laughs> And the 
people that are interrogating him says, um, not even one of your million dollar bribes can get out of, get you out of this one. He says, two, two million US standing offer for anybody who springs me. They lash back. Oh, you think you're in some kind of banana republic, which always makes me think of a store. And he says, I think I'm going to be home soon, eh? And laughs. <laughs> Sanchez is great. <laughs> Sanchez is good. <laughs> He's easily one of my favorite villains because you're just like, he's charming as hell, despite the fact that he's fucking evil. And that kind of a line is one of my favorite lines is just him being like, he's he's been captured. And he's just sort of like, eh, fine, I'll pay two million. I'll be out here soon. <laughs> it's kind of, that's so cool. Here's a question that I got. There's a custom, you see, the bride always gets to kiss her best man. Yeah. I have never heard of this custom anywhere in any wedding scenario ever. And uh it it, it comes <laughs> it off sounds more, like Bond came up with. It it sounds like it should have been something that he should be saying, right? And she's the one that's just sort of like she's fawning all over him and <laughs> I, I said this to you. I said, Look, I'm glad because they're gonna bring up Tracy. And I said, I'm glad Tracy is canon, but this Woman wants to sleep with Bond. <laughs> I just think that this was a weird thing because you can show that Bond is like really close with Della and Felix in a lot of other ways, but that I don't know. This was a weird choice. Why are they kissing on the lips? I think I even asked you. I was like, okay, so you following this tradition at your wedding? Right, like, yeah. Like, I, I've never heard of this before. I've never seen it, even in any other movies or anything. So it's just odd. I don't know if this was a thing back then. I don't know if this is... Because you can't even say that this is a British thing, because it's not. She, British isn't... No. Uh, they're, not, they're not in the UK. They're not... Uh, you know, it, Della and uh, Felix aren't. So it's like, no, this is just a choice that they made for the movie, and I really don't understand it. It sounds like she just wanted to find an excuse to kiss Bond. Should we ask Titus (laughs) (laughs) O'Neill? If anybody gets that joke, go to smartcoutmoment.com, check out the pro wrestling stuff. Funny that when Bond goes to Felix's office and he sees Pam there, he gives him a look like, huh? And he goes, oh, it's strictly business, my friend. Dude, you don't have to explain yourself. Bond is the one kissing your wife two seconds ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bond's the one like, you cheating on your wife? No, you're, his wife is cheating on him <laughs> with you. <laughs> like, uh, Dell is played by Priscilla Barnes, who I know from nothing else except for the fortune teller with the third nipple from All Rats. Which is quite titillating. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, Sanchez's law is uh, lead or silver. I think that that's cool. And uh, with a name like Ed Killifer, you know he's going to be a bad guy, <laughs> right? Yeah, uh, I saw this coming from my way. Same for you, Callum. I mean. I can't say for certain that I was expecting him to be the one to do it because there were two people in that, in the uh, interrogation room. And to be fair, the other guy outside of Killifer was the one that seemed to perk his ears up when he saw heard the $2 million. So I assumed it was going to be him instead. He also... I, I kind of looked at that strangling thing as like, okay, pal, that was a little too much. You're the guy who's going to, you know, end up turning heel. Because wrestling. <laughs> he also says that he just came by to kiss the bride. Della gets around. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's one of the things I also wanted to bring up is that... So this is our first introduction to Della in this entire series. Mm-hmm. And also our last introduction. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. It's, we're supposed to believe that she's has this really long... Her and Felix have this really long-term relationship with Bond and... That, that, that there's obviously we know how much that Bond has gone been through with Felix. Admittedly, lots of other different Felix, Felixes, but still, the same character has been around this entire time. We don't know anything about Della, and f- as far as the only bits and pieces that I've seen of Felix, he seems to be a bit of a playboy in the other Bond movies, like they're basically an American version of Bond. 
he doesn't seem to be strictly tied down to anybody in particular. So it, felt, yeah. it just felt a bit weird of like saying that our oh, bond is such good friends with Della and Felix, whereas it just doesn't feel like. And it comes across in the movie as well that it's just people that seemingly just met each other, at least from my perspective. Sharky, I think, is the the bigger standout to me. Because I kind of feel like that should have been Quarrel. It might have worked better, but I think this was a movie, and this is a Bond, really, that just was so, no, we're going to tie it all together. We're going to forget about what you know, that everything is different in every film. We're going to tie it all together and make it seem like, oh, they're friends. They've been through everything together. Even though you know in the last film... Felix, who was much younger, was yeah. like, ah, hey, yeah, we're going to have a party with these two girls. It's great. We're all going to party. <laughs> Imagine if that would have been the case, though. I mean, Quarrel dies in Doctor No. The books are a different order than the movies, too. So, like, Live and Let Die was the second book, and that's the, uh, like, eighth movie or so. And this one borrows a lot from Live and Let Die, actually. But we had Quarrel Jr. in Live and Let Die, and I think that that would have been a good way to do that if they would have just made the character instead of Sharky, if it would have been Quarrel Jr. And then it would have been like, you know, kind of a tie in. You got to get the shark puns in though. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get to that later on too. Sharky gives uh, Felix and Della some fishing lures. They're not going uh, fishing on my honeymoon. I never really liked that line. Um, but Della and Felix give uh, Bond a present too. A genuine Felix lighter of sorts. It's engraved and it's got a huge goddamn flame on it. <laughs> That seems like it's practically a Q uh, branch gadget. It comes in handy. It does. I am not a smoker. I've never had any use for carrying a lighter around, but I've always thought to myself, if I did, I'd want that. <laughs> Just to be like, this fucking flamethrower kind of thing. I'd imagine that you would get one lighter, and it would be a trusty lighter, and you would name it Felix. Oh, 100%. If I had like some kind of Zippo or something, I'd get a little like... Uh... I probably would, uh, I'd be stupid enough that I would pay for the engravement and have it say, uh, to James, love Della and Felix. And people would be like, who's James? And I'd be like, it's a different story. Um, Sanchez is on a route with all these guards, armored truck and all, and color for Terrence Heel, as we said. He sends them off the bridge into the water. People are waiting for scuba tanks and ready to bust them out and everything. And... We could see that come in. I mean, he said, no, I'll be out soon. And he's right. And we get one of my absolute favorite moments from any of the films in the entire franchise. Top 10 moment for sure for me. And that we're talking like action moments, funny moments, whatever. Just absolute one of my favorite moments. Della wants to give James another gift, her garter. And she reminds him the one who catches the garters, the, the next one who, and he just shakes his head. No. Thanks, Della. It's time I left. And she tosses it anyway to him, giggling, and he catches it, looks down, gives this weak smile, and leaves. And she just says to Felix, did I say something wrong? And he says, he was married once, but it was a long time ago. You would know that if you were friends. Ah. Uh, like, Bond even screeches the car when he drives off. Like, he just can't wait to get the fuck out of there, or he's not thinking at the moment properly to drive right around. I love this so much. Yeah, great team. The more one leaves bigger impact for me than this. The one from Spy You Love Me? Yeah, I just felt this was just an attempt to cash in, an attempt to try and replicate that, and I think it failed. I like this one so much better. The... One from the Spy Who Loved Me I really love because of the whole quick anger about it. But I like the sadness of this one. That his first reaction is just, no, no. Like, I don't want to catch that. That symbolizes something that I'm not into. And when she just goes ahead and does it, I love that he just kind of like, he smiles for a brief second. Which is almost like he remembers Tracy in like a good way and then snaps back out of it like, can't be weak. That's easily one of my favorite moments. I love that one so much. Um, let's go to the shark torture scene here. Fortunately, right after Bond leaves, 
goons pop up. They go after Felix Della. We meet Milton Crest, one of my favorite villains of the movie. I love Crest. I love his drunken fucking speech patterns and everything. Uh, he wants to deep six Killifer. And Sanchez, uh, who's super all cool about this, has said that he's made a deal with him. Because Sanchez is fucking likable in a weird way. No, I made a deal with this guy. Don't kill him. I like Crest's line. I like it. It's like how he delivers his lines. And uh, Robert Davi, the one who plays Fran Sanchez, was the one that created the line, loyalty is more important to me than money, which is like the through line throughout this entire film. So credit to the actor for understanding the character better than even the ones that were writing the scripts. That is cool. He studied yeah. with a whole bunch of different things. He talked to actual drug dealers and they were kind of like, yeah, you did a good job. <laughs> it, it is what makes him a somewhat likable villain like you say is the fact that he's consistently about the loyalty aspect of it he's he is vindictive and he's cruel to the people that are against him or turn their back on him but that's in order to engender the idea of if you're loyal to me then you can have basically anything you want out of me and explains why he went after lupe it explains Basically, every kill that he does in the rest of the movie, it's one of the most consistent characters, I think. He's an amazing villain. Yeah, I'd say one of the best, absolutely. And Sanchez even yeah. warns Crest about uh, no fooling around with my girl, which is like, you're setting that up, you know? <laughs> the only better villain that I've seen thus far is Scaramanga. I like that he see, he has fun with things, too. So he's not just like a brutal killer and that's it. You can't really connect with him because he jokes around about that. And he's like, are you kidding? Like, I wouldn't fool around with your girl. Not after what you did with the guy to the in the islands. And he goes, oh, you liked my little Valentina. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Imagine being that horrible of a human being where you can cut out somebody's heart and just be like, that's oh, a little Valentine. All right. It was Tuesday kind of a thing. Well, the guy he's about to be taking on is that guy as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, uh, we also meet um, one of the other henchmen, Dario, paid, played by a super young Benicio Del Toro. Do you see that going? <laughs> I mean, it, it's nice to see him pop back up eventually. I couldn't tell it was Benicio Del Toro because he's not so exactly young. An actor that, yeah, but it's not exactly an actor that jumps off the top of my head anyway. So, so I couldn't tell, obviously, in that regard. What about you, Rob? Is Del Toro, was that kind of like, oh, Del Toro's in this? Or? Didn't see it coming, but it's good. And he's a great character as well. Fucking loved everything about him, including the way he dies. Del Toro is an actor that I, I hold in high, uh, high esteem. I think that he seems like a cool dude. He, everything I've seen him in, he's been great. Like, if you want to check out more Del Toro stuff, check out The Usual Suspects. He's fantastic in that. Um, the Way of the Gun is a movie that nobody ever talks about, but he's great in that. He's great in Traffic. He's fun as the collector in the MCU. He's just a weird dude. He's so awesome. I wanted him to be Thanos originally. I thought that he could have been a good Thanos. But... Um, the Sicario films are great, though. I haven't seen if Sicario. You like, if you like this kind of stuff that we're covering here. Sicario is on my list of why haven't I watched that yet? I'll definitely check that out. And he immediately, of course, you hate him, too, because when Felix asks where Della is, he says, don't worry, we gave her a nice honeymoon. I popped for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. These guys are brutal. Like, I mean, shit, we, a couple movies ago, we've got Max Zorin being all like, oh, I'm happiest in the saddle and we're going to set Bond up for, you know, that the horse is going to be a little bit uh, unwildly. And in this one, they're like, yeah, we raped and killed Felix's wife. And it's like, fuck. <laughs> that might have been one of your, oh my God, what the fuck, holy shit moments that you had sent me. No, those were reserved specifically like for just, the brutal death, but I love this line and it actually made me laugh. I just kept thinking 
oh, whenever Tony's on his honeymoon, I'm just going to say honeymoon like that. <laughs> honeymoon. <laughs> and they hook Felix up to the other end as animal carcass. He gets lowered into a shark tank, and they say there's worse things than dying. Today's the first day of the rest of your life. We actually see the shark bite off Felix's leg. So I thought, and Callum, you can tell me if this is the moment you were talking about. I thought Felix was going to die. You know, like, they're just a cult character here. And then just, oh, Bond is going to avenge Felix's death because he's closer to Felix than he is Bella. But no, no, he just, there's worse things than dying, I guess, and that's living without a leg and without your wife. Even though he seemed pretty comfortably taken care of by the end of the thing. <laughs> We're going to talk about that. I hate that. <laughs> It definitely isn't the thing that I'm talking about. Really? Hmm. I no, thought that that might have been it. No, way further down in the movie. So that is one of the most uh, gritty things that we've seen in any of these. It's, it, I would say it is the worst thing that we've seen in any of the movies so far. At this point, eventually we see something that I think is even worse later on. But... That's a character that normally when these characters die in these movies, they get killed off screen. They get killed in, you know, an explosion kills them or they get shot or VJ gets a fucking yo-yo saw, but we don't see it. It's just like, uh, you know, they died and whatever. And Saunders, like we, we don't really get to see what happens with the, um, the trick door thing. But this one, you see him get his leg bitten off and his wife is raped and murdered and all that. It's mm. definitely just like, we're not playing games now. Like, we want this to seem more realistic and drug dealers do these kind of horrible things and screw it, we're just going to show it kind of. I can understand why a lot of people think that that's like, Bond's more about escapism and some people are like, I don't like this. I don't want to see things like that. I personally love it. <laughs> it feels it feels to me like one of those moments where because it happens like about 10 15 minutes into the movie it's an instance where i could kind of see people who are expecting a more traditional Bond movie to get up and leave the cinema because mm -hmm. that's like it, it's like there are there are movies in this at this point in time like die hard and robo cop where it, you do have this ultra violent aspect to a lot of them but Bond has such a legacy behind it of not being this that by going from zero to 60, pretty much. And maybe, maybe you could say it was speeding up a little bit in the living daylights, but then to go this hard into the other direction for this movie, I could see being very difficult for some to come to terms with. Yeah. Cause even the living daylights, despite the fact that that's a big step in that direction compared to something like a view to a kill, it's weird to go from, Bond's got these weird goggles and he's hanging out, hitting on Stacy in a view to a kill. Cause that's around this point in the movie or it might not be quite at that point, but, um, and then in the living daylights around this point in the movie, we've got milk bottle explosives and that's a lot more fun compared to somebody's wife is killed on her wedding day and you lost part of, uh, your body to a shark thing. And like, that is uh, that like you said zero to 60 kind of so i could see people being just like oh i took my kids to see this oh you know kind of a thing especially the <laughs> friend of the director uh john glenn the one that was like the one with octopussy where the kid held his uh hands over his face because he was afraid about the octopus imagine what that little kid would have been doing in this part um Bonds at the Pan Am place. He finds out about Sanchez escaping. He takes off, goes to Felix's place, finds the door open. Dell is dead. Her wedding gown. Uh, she's on the bed. Her eyes are open. Felix's office is trashed. He's in a on the couch in a body bag. And there's a note attached to him that says he disagreed with something that ate him. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, I saw that. And I laughed, and I knew you probably did a whole lot more than laugh. <laughs> uh, I this is where I'll say Dalton came across as wooden. Him going, Della, I, 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 <laughs> yeah, that was there. That that was one of the things that really stuck out to me. As well. Yeah, I, 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 I don't like the way that he says Della. Yeah, 
Um, like his, it's like his mouth doesn't move when he's doing it, but mm-hmm. then he scre- manages to scream that out in some really poor way. Yeah, I I hate that take. I fully agree with you guys. It's oh, kind of thing. It's like you could have done that a couple more times, gotten it right. Yeah. Uh, this whole idea of Felix being mauled by a shark and that note being put on him is from the Live and Let Die novel. It's not a creation of the movie. It's not like, you know, you would think that the way that this movie's going, that they would have been like, oh, well, let's go harsher and let's create something like that. This is Ian Fleming, the second book. I don't know how that factors in with this. I never read the books. I don't know if it's just sort of like, well, you know, anytime that you see Felix in the future, he's in a wheelchair or something, but second book, Felix gets mauled by a shark by uh, Kananga. Or, well, his, he's not Kananga in the book because they renamed him, but um, by Mr. Big's people or whatever. And that's uh, I, not the end of Felix, really, kind of, but sort of. They say that his leg is gone below the knee. They might be able to save his arm. And uh, <laughs> just one of those line deliveries, uh, I think it's uh, funny too. The the guy says, you can bet it, it was a chainsaw, drug dealers, and all these, like, they'd like to do that. And later on, Shark, he says, chainsaw my ass. <laughs> I know Shark bite when I see one. <laughs> I just like how he says that. It's always stuck with me. Uh, the agent fills Bond in on how Sanchez has vanished. He's out of their jurisdiction. They can't get an extradition. All these countries are going to protect him. And just, well, you know, that sucks. So Bond's like, well, if they're not going to do anything, I'm going to do something. Let's go shark hunting. Love it. Because everybody was so resigned. And this is like that realism where sometimes you do see this in the real world where people are just like, ah, yeah, but, you know, it's one of those things. Shrug. And Bond was like, no, no, no. No, we're not fucking letting that happen to Felix and just blowing it off. Triggers that sociopath part. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Bond and Sharky are looking at some different places, trying to find out who supplied the shark. That sounds weird to say. <laughs> Do you supply the shark? <laughs> I like that he says he's from Universal Exports. I love when they use that little dummy organization. Anytime that they bring up Universal Exports, it gets a pop out of me. And he's looking for Carcarigan Carcarius. Great white shark. It's one of those like Jeopardy types of things where by watching this movie, I've always known that species name. You could be like, you know, what uh, the Carcarigan Carcarius is whatever. I'd be like, you know, compliments of Sharky. It's a great white shark. Uh, Bond talks to Crest, gets all the info he needs. There's a, another exchange that I've always liked. Goodbye, Mr. Goodbye. And he sees that uh, Felix's flower from his tux is there. So he knows full blown Crest is the one responsible for doing this. Um, you guys think about these maggots. Weird. I had seen this <laughs> scene, so I knew it was coming, but weird. Like, Ugh. they don't look like maggots. Yeah, they're some kind of weird plastic something or other. I don't know, but they just. The sound. Mm. Bleh, it's like. I mean, I was more um, interested in the clearly fake shark that bumps up, of, um, bumps up the grate when Bond is crossing over into the warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a, a robot shark, essentially. It's like the one from Jaws and the uh uh like Universal Studios kind of thing. Mm. <laughs> They're keeping cocaine there. They toss he tosses a goon into the maggot thing, uh pulls a different guard into an electric eel tank, because that's totally how it works, right? That they just go <laughs> just like a fucking toaster. That felt like a bond death to me. If it's like a what? That felt that felt like a, a death that Bond would give to a, a henchman. Yeah, no quip afterward. That is like the whole shocking, positively shocking type thing, though. Well, he was immediately under gunpoint again by yeah. for this time. And he got the quip in with the whole bon appetit. So yeah, <laughs> he's good. Killifer really likes to say "old buddy," and they yeah. they have a whole thing with, with that. Even Bond says it back uh, twice. There, I think four times in this little moment, they say old buddy because he's like, oh, you know, over there, old buddy. And he goes, is that how you treated your old buddy, Felix and whatever? And 
Uh, Killer gets knocked into the whole thing. He's hanging over the same shark pit that Felix had, and he says, I'll split the two million with you. And uh, Bond says, you want it. <laughs> I always hate how he says that way. You want it. You keep it old, buddy. Slams it into his chest. Killifer falls in the shark pit. And Sharky says, what a terrible waste of money. I, 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 I will say, I don't like that they're joking around a little bit when this is happening. I, I wouldn't be, if I were in Sharky's case, I wouldn't be all like, oh, you know, like, let's joke around. I'd still be like, my God, my friend, you know, like kind of, but it's a movie, you know, you got to give it a little bit of. Leeway. No, I, I like I like this death. It's very um, it's very point well poignant and like fitting what had occurred earlier. Like he's the one that uh, takes it afterwards because he's the one that sold Felix out pretty much. Yeah, he deserves to die, and his name's Killifer. So yeah, almost making up for the fact that the guy who really deserved to die in the last film didn't die. <laughs> Maybe that's how they did it to uh, Koskov. They just dangled him over a shark pit, <laughs> kind of you know. He's like figs, pi- uh, uh, pigs, uh, borscht, cake, sharks. What's going on here? Let's go to the Hemingway house here. DEA agent Hawkins. I always forget to uh, that his name's Hawkins. He talks about how he can't keep covering up Bond's vigilante stuff, which seems like a very like Commissioner Gordon and Batman kind of thing. Of like, so uh, you know, they said that they found the guy at the docks all tied up, and you you hear anything about that kind of a thing, which I like. Uh, Bond's doing like the anonymous tip stuff for the cocaine and kill for his body and all that they found like little portions of and Heming- uh, Hawkins takes him to the Hemingway house where we see some agents and M who says that Bond was supposed to be in Istanbul he leaves it um, he says leave it to the Americans it's their mess let them clear it up god damn it M like you're back to being a complete fucking asshole it seems like everybody it seems like when you enter certain eras in time where being edgy is the cool thing and everybody is just a dick, mm-hmm. that's what's kind of happening here. But but he's completely justified. He he is to an extent. It's just the way that he says these but things. He is, he's totally justified. Bond he says like, you know, you got to do your job. He says that Lighter knew the risks. But Bond brings up a point. He's like, well, what about Della? And the way that M says, spare me the sentimental rubbish. Is kind of just like, all right, dude, like, that's a little harsh. <laughs> Maybe it's a little harsh, but it's just a case of that's what, I mean, Bond's a double O. Mm-hmm. Bond's supposed to be, oh, that's harsh, callous, but he's supposed to get things done without any sentiment, without any yeah at- emotional attachment. That's how M, so, I assume M selects and um, MI6 select who they do this job so anyone that is displaying that type of thing is really no good to them because they're too emotional I mean he he is supposed to be a double O he's supposed to not have that kind of side it's kind of like shut off your emotions and do your job you robot you're the psychopath that we send out to be a hitman kind of a thing but I like it even more the line that he like when Bond resigns and he says we're not a country club 007 that to me is better than him just being like ah fuck Felix kind of a thing you know and I like that when Bond is supposed to hand over his uh, weapon, he says, I guess it's a farewell to arms. <laughs> it seems like the rest of the movie might see, you know, M trying to have Bond either captured or executed or something. Because he just sort of lets Bond go off. Well, that's, again, now this is the moment that I was talking about earlier, which I think is... I got super excited about the idea because now Bond is both like headstrong in this mission of getting revenge and dealing with Sanchez, but then he's also departed MI6. He's been had his license to kill revoked. He's going out on the run essentially. And I was basically say I basically said apart from one small instance in the movie, one really small instance in this movie going forward, there's none of that. He's essentially like, okay, just let this rogue agent just go do whatever he's going to do. And I just feel like that was a real missed opportunity to have, like, Bond is pretty much surrounded. Like, he's doing these things and more of it gets interrupted or he has to essentially subdue P. 
people that he works with in order to this is where he could have got another double o on the case or something along that to try and take down bond i just don't feel they did enough in that regard throughout the movie i'll defend it by saying if that would have happened i think that that would have added an extra half an hour to the runtime because that wasn't really the story it wasn't so much that Bond is out of MI6, it's more him on the revenge thing. And we get later movies that they keep revisiting this, actually I think to a fault, where they keep playing more into Bond is on the run. It's mostly the Daniel Craig. We'll get into when we get into the Daniel Craig movies, but one of my main criticisms about the Craig films is they seem to have four ideas that they do over and over and over again, and they never want to fully commit to it. And they, this is one of them, of this, like, Bond has to be the rogue in every one of those movies, and it's never about him being the rogue, but that's, like, the hook of it. Whereas this one, I felt like it was more so, like, when they address it later on, he's just like, Bond will be fine, and you see what happens, kind of a thing. Later, when they do it, I think it's more of a problem, because then it becomes, like, Ooh, in this one, he's like that, but then it kind of ends quick, you know? Right. I, I disagree. I think it's more consistently approached in Craig's movies. Yes, he extends the runtime, but it actually tells that part of the story. I think if you're going to introduce that element in this story, then you need to play to it. And if you don't, then you're basically failing your own story. You don't think that the time. revenge thing takes more precedence? I think it does. I think, well, it should take more precedence, but I also think that you've introduced a subplot here, which is interesting, and then you don't play to it, which means that you might as well not have this scene involved in the first place. To me, this then just becomes a scene to get M's and screen time, rather than actually being a part of the movie. So it's almost like I would rather one or two things. Either you have this scene and you add a bit of extra time to the movie or cut bits out somewhere else to tell that part of the story, or you make the runtime even shorter by cutting the scene out altogether. Well, the reason they added this was because they felt like they needed a way to get the government out of it, where if they have no jurisdiction over that, then Bond shouldn't be doing that as part of a mission for them. So they wanted to make it like, well, MI6 isn't sanctioning this kind of a thing. You know how like in the past it's been like, you should take a leave of absence, but if you go after the man with the golden gun, then we're okay with it. or like. Uh, yeah, like that that kind of... A, I'm blanking on another one of them. Um, I'm sure that there's like five other examples that I just can't think of. But this one's more like, if this is a personal vendetta, we're not going to sanction it, so let's have M be like, all right, you're out of it, kind of. No, I think, again, I don't... I, I, I get the reason to do it, but then you have to build on it. I think it... it like I said, I think it's wasted otherwise. So, again, I understand the purpose of doing it, but and I understand that the Revenge storyline still takes pre precedent, but I just don't think it's played to enough. And that's a big hit to the movie for me. And you're not going to convince me otherwise. What if I say, please? <laughs> no, I, I see where you're coming from. I think that uh, it could have been, uh, uh, there could have uh, yeah, been maybe even like one scene where somebody's trying to arrest him or something. Yeah, it's, it's again. It's not like I disagree with your perspective. Like you're more than welcome to take the perspective that you yeah. take up. But it's just a case of I just don't feel like the movie plays enough to that point. And it could have been a really interesting story because it's something. At least at this point, I know what you say about the Craig ones. That maybe it does play on that one a little bit too much. I like the fact that it's a consistent part of Craig's Bond character. But I feel like this was the first time they've ever really introduced that element to the Bond franchise so far. And then it kind of just falls by the wayside in favor of the the bigger plot of this movie. Well, Craig is also the only Bond with, like, continuity. Yeah. Know? So there's a good reason for that. I will say the thing I'm going to harp on the most when it comes to the Craig thing isn't that. It's going to be on this whole, what about he, if he gets old? <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> we'll get to that. Um, let's pop back over here. They use the same sound effect from Spy Who Loved Me and A View to a Kill for a brief second when they have the computer thing. They just really like that little computer sound. It's just a little bit of trivia. Uh, not to go all the way back to the beginning, but I have to ask Callum, did the sound effects for the gunshots bother you? Did they not seem too cartoony? I honestly didn't notice anything. That yeah, good. well, maybe it was just me, because some of these sound effects really sounded like 
you know, we're just going to take these cartoon gun noises and plop them in here. Uh, maybe that's just me. Yeah, I never noticed it. I, I might have to try to listen back to them or something. Crest is a slimy drunk. You know, Lupe says, stop peeking through my windows. And he's like, oh, we rigged that beauty contest. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, signal on the monitor is just a man array. Or maybe it's Bond in a man array disguise. <laughs> I think it's better than the crocodile. At least this one I, I buy a little bit more. And yeah. Bond uh, sneaks on board the wave crest, notices a ton of money in the pressure chamber, which is going to be important later on. Comes across Lupe, puts a knife to her, make a sound, and you're dead. Um, poor Lupe, man. I'm a fan of Lupe, by the way. Let, let's talk about her for a little bit. She covers for Bond. He notices the whip marks on her, and uh, like I said, like, poor girl. She's like, oh, it was my fault. I did something wrong that made him angry. Uh, Lupe is a very tortured character. I'm still not a fan of her interactions with Bond, but this is easily the most callous we've ever seen Bond towards a woman. Like, this was just really, really cold. Yeah, I, I mean, again, I feel sorry for her. She's involved in this whole situation now with Sanchez that she doesn't really want to be a part of. And then Bond's essentially after her as well, and Again, she's kind of been, I guess, programmed by this point to just be very distrustful of all men in general. And to be fair, Bond is not helping that matter at all by being so, um, just so desperate to get Sanchez that he's basically willing to let everyone else suffer to before he gets to that point. And yeah, I, I, I like her and I like the the backstory aspect of it. I think there are parts later on in the movie where I start to mm. wane a little bit towards her. Mm-hmm. I think there's one line in particular where all three of us are going to harp on. Probably, yeah. <clears throat> yep. In any other movie, though, she would be the sacrificial lamb, wouldn't she? Isn't it weird that she doesn't die in a movie where everybody seems to die? Or, like, the just main Bond girl. Like, if they were to tell the story of she's tortured by this man and, you know, Bond helps her and they stay together... By the end of it, that would have been one thing, but there was just another woman in the movie that was a lot better. And it kind of made Lupe seem like they should have used her as a sacrificial lamb. It, it is a bit odd because I think obviously there's one kind of instance in this movie which kind of bucks that trend, but maybe it's they're trying to conflate the idea of both doing this whole more action orientated like people dying all over the place type thing that we'd seen in other movies, but also then building on the strong female character aspect that you're trying to see in this period as well. And so it's conflated with the idea of, okay, everyone's got to die except the women. We can't kill the women. Minus the women Della. Be... <laughs> oh yeah. Minus Della and minus that, um, that Hong Kong, uh, <laughs> agent that got shot up as well later on in the movie. But, but yeah, I mean, Della's kind of the sacrificial lamb in the grand scheme of things because she, She's the one that is the catalyst for this entire thing. Obviously, what, what happened to Felix, but then also she's the one that's dead out of all this. So. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's always one of those things that it surprises me that that wasn't, as far as I'm aware, a part of the script. I don't remember them ever having, like, I've never come across a, a story about it being like, well, we were originally going to kill off her character or something. Because I would have thought if I were making a pass at the script, I probably would have killed off Lupe. and. That's not like, you know, oh, I hate the character, let me kill her off. That's just me being like, I think that that would be another moment of being just like, oh, man, like, Felix is fucked, and Del is dead, and Sharky's dead, and Lupe's dead, and like, that would just be like, God, everything is coming to a head here, and she ends up getting a relatively happy ending, which it's good, you know. But yeah, Sharky, yeah, he's been captured and killed. And then the guy jokes around, hey, guess what, Mr. Crest? His name was Sharky. <laughs> At what point in the movie did you know Sharky was doomed? <laughs> when I first saw him. <laughs> yeah, when, yeah, 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 pretty much when he was part of the original. <laughs> <laughs> when he's like, you know, uh, are you going to try to get yourself killed? If I don't bring you back to the wedding, I'm certain to be a dead man. But it's like, no, Sharky's the dead man. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think I was pretty sure about that, but then I was absolutely certain when Bond said, "Okay, I need you to drive me out to this 
place. <laughs> like, oh yeah, he's not coming back. Bond kills that guy with a har- harpoon. Compliments of Sharky. Yeah. And we... That's, uh, but that's kind of, again, it's another aspect that we will we'll repeat throughout this entire movie as well, is that in Bond's pursuit of revenge to like get his revenge on uh, Lighter for, for what happened to Lighter and Della, basically everyone else he works with suffers or dies. Yeah. It's kind of and almost I'm, like he should have listened to his uh, words of wisdom from Free Your Eyes Only. About mm. if you go after somebody for revenge, you know, dig two graves. Bond should dig like fifteen. <laughs> yeah, and that's and that's another part of it which makes it again, it makes it more, I guess, real because Bond is not behaving as he usually would do. He's got again, he's being fueled by emotion and his thirst for revenge, and that's making him sloppy, and that's making him other people suffer because they're trying to help him out with his issues. And at the end of it, he's getting to the point where it's like, okay, I need to do this alone because if you guys are involved, you might suffer as well. But it also makes me go like, what? I really, again, I want these guys um, like Sanchez and the others to suffer because they're awful people, but I want Bond to die with them, essentially. (laughs) That's getting to that point where it's like, okay, I want Bond to get his revenge, but I want Bond to die in the process as well because he's causing as much harm as he's giving (laughs) out. Yeah, he's he's fucking up a lot of things. <laughs> During the money trade off, there's this cocaine deal on a seaplane and all. Bond opens the container, stabs all the cocaine packs, which I have a note down that just says, Those fish are gonna be so high. <laughs> I like the bit where Bond uses the harpoon, he hooks himself to the seaplane and he does some water skiing. I think that's kind of fun. Again, that's that is more a traditional Bond aspect of it, but I can kind of somewhat get on board with it. That that'd be waterboarding then, uh-huh. instead of water skiing. <laughs> <Stop it. laughs> board board is the expression that I usually have throughout most of this movie, so I guess that kind of works. <laughs> there, there's no way this movie was fucking insane. <laughs> it's just when Dalton's talking. Oh, well, I'll just do that. <laughs> and, but and actually, um. Pam as well, which we're going to get to on too soon. Uh, Bond gets the computer disc from Felix's office, the one that he hid behind a picture of Della, and he goes on the computer and notices that everybody basically that's been in this Sanchez case is dead except for Pam, the woman he was talking to earlier. So I just want to talk about something a little bit quickly just before that. It's um, after Bond gets control of the plane, after kicking the people out of it, he sees all the money in there and he gets this huge smile on his face. Like, he is laughing his ass off about the fact that he's got this much money. Well, he's not laughing because he's got the money. He's laughing because he ripped them off. <laughs> I guess so, but it's just a case of... I, I almost got the impression of, like, okay, Bond is happy about the fact that he's not working for MI6 anymore. Now he can just... <laughs> <laughs> he took it as, like, Bond being like, I'm rich, bitch. That kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> was, I think it was just the fact that he was smiling in general. Made me a little bit... Maybe earlier, later on in the movie when things are a bit more called off and he can start to enjoy like I say enjoy himself anymore enjoy <laughs> killing all these people but it's just like the fact that he was so excited about the fact because Sharky just died but like, he just died in front of him just yeah. the one person that he's allowed to die and he's like laughing about the fact that he's ripped all these guys off and he's thrown two people out of a plane it's like haha that's great look at all this I've got now and it, those guys suffered oh yeah Sharky's dead we probably <laughs> well, forgot about that he's, he's just he's a fucking him. lunatic at this point yeah. like you know, uh, the... plus he's back uh, in the air, and we know that Bond owns space, so he's, he's, <laughs> he's back in his. Uh... It, it just makes him more unlikable than any other Bond, really, in my mind. Because again, if they're trying to go with the flavor of the more aggressive uh, lead role, which is a bit more, yeah, again, overall more violent, it's not like I watch Die Hard and I feel conflicted about what John McClane is doing. I know John McClane's the good guy. He's a bit of an, he's a bit rough around the edges, but he's not. We know what his purpose is to be in that regard. Like, whereas this Bond is like, yeah, you're a bit too, you're enjoying this a bit too much. Uh, Bond like, goes to this CD bar to meet up with Pam. That's kind of out of the norm. That that kind of bar atmosphere breaks down real quick, though. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's kind of typical of the bar atmosphere as well. So, <laughs> yeah, especially in the eighties, you know, this is like a 
Rob, what's the name of the uh, movie? Damn it, I'm blanking on it. Uh, the Patrick Swayze one, Roadhouse. Yeah, I was gonna say Roughhouse. Roadhouse. So, uh, there's, uh, I'm very conflicted about Pam as a character. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm gonna be more on your range of this than I think Rob's gonna be highest out of the three of us. I'll say that. So yeah. I think that she, from what, from her actions. And the role that she plays in this movie is very, very good because the actual character itself is very heavily involved in the entire thing. She doesn't take no for an answer when Bond says, oh, leave this to professional. She's very forthright. She's always involved. She's helping Bond out throughout the entire thing. I think the actress is very wooden. I think that she, I think if it was a, an actress with more experience, because I believe when I checked it, this is like um, the actress's fifth movie. And she was like a model before this. So I feel like they needed someone with more experience, more range, more emotion to tell this story than the one they ended up going with. So uh, spoilers, because like I said, with this overall film, I put her right at the top. But I think as time goes on, I'll shift it around and she'll end up being underneath some of the main Bond girls we've already seen. But I loved the story told and the pairing so much that I initially did forgive the fact that, yes, she is a little wooden as an actress. But I I was so happy to see a good story told because I'm still kind of reeling from the more stuff where it's just all over the place. I feel like Pam... And I guess I'll I'll lump Lupe in here too for comparison. I've got Lupe above Pam. And I saw that. I I think that they both are very they're they're good characters in their own ways, because Lupe's the more the kept woman and the you know, the traumatic past and all this other kind of stuff. And Pam is the more I'm gonna, you know, fight and kind of kick some ass and kind of stuff. But yeah, I do feel like there's certain scenes where either of them, uh, and I think it's a little bit more standout when it comes to Pam. Carrie Lowell, she kind of is unlikable in some moments, as opposed to tough. And that's where I think a lot of people have an issue with certain. Like I have, I know have no problem whatsoever with the strong female character type. I hate when they, and then that's the character, you know, like when you see certain people in movies and they go, well, what's the strong female character? And you go, okay, don't use the phrase strong female character. What's the character? And the people go, uh, that bugs me. And thankfully she isn't just that, but I think that there's moments where she's played like that, where people tend to think bitchiness is tough as opposed to toughness is tough and you can be a tough female character and have agency and not be a pushover and not be a bitch at the same time. Uh, I think a good example of that is actually Gal Gadot for wonder woman, wonder woman. <laughs> she is somebody who I think she's tough in all of the ways that she's done her different movies and she never comes off as being bitchy. Whereas, like, sometimes Carrie Lowell's playing Pam as, like, unlikable. And I don't like that. I think it was a fine line back in those days where they were really just trying to... At that point, they probably saw bitchiness as being tough. And I wouldn't even mm -hmm. necessarily say she came off like a complete bitch. It's just that, like... Through time, that's the way we end up seeing it. Yeah. Because we know that there are different ways to portray strong women. Yeah, and I I have Pam up pretty high. So it doesn't, I don't want it to come off as being like that I, I hate the Pam character or anything. It's just there's there's a big difference between some scenes for me where I don't really like her in the bar scene all that much. I think it's kind of a little too try hard. I like her a like, lot gotta, better. I got a bigger gun. You hit the deck. Like, yeah, that, that stuff kind of throws me off a little bit. And like, I like her a lot better once we get into the casino stuff, for instance. 
But she doesn't know what's happened to Felix. Dario's there. She points a shotgun at his crotch, punches her throne. You know, old school bar fight. Bond almost gets killed with a swordfish. <laughs> Some, I don't get the bar fight thing in any movie or any scenario. I don't understand why people go like, hey, these two people started punching each other, so everybody else should start punching. It's never been a thing that's made any sense to me. It's... I imagine in their warped mind, it's like a machismo kind of thing. Like, <laughs> fuck yeah, oh, that guy hit somebody, I'm gonna hit somebody too. Yeah. Like. <laughs> if you've been in a bar fight that happened like this, drop a comment below and tell us what was going through your mind if you were just sort of like, you know, Jim punched Phil, so I'm gonna hit Ted. <laughs> you know, kind of. I also don't think you can blow a hole through a wall with a shotgun. I don't know, for sure. I've never shot a shotgun through a wall, but... I don't think it works that way. Well, Bond owns space, so let's spend less time <laughs> learning about these kinds of things. <laughs> Pam gets shot in the back. Bond speeds off in the boat. Pam's fine. She jokes about the Kevlar vest being great. And I think Bond has every right in the world to be pissed at her about just kind of joking around at that, even though Bond jokes about that all the time. <laughs> yeah, again, it's something that makes him unlikable because, and it's maybe something that I bring up slightly later as well which just like he's trying to protect her in that regard i guess he feels like he needs to protect her, like it's too da- this is too dangerous to her and he's only saying that because she's a woman well like, there's no there's no other reason he could be saying that other than the fact i mean obviously we know that she could be in danger like he knows that she's like that uh, sanchez now knows that she's an informant so he's she's in danger but i don't think he would be saying that type of thing if it wasn't a woman. a woman. I would argue the point, and yes, he did say a woman. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I would argue the point that he's seen so many people that he loves just getting picked off. He's probably like, I don't, I don't need to see another person die. What the fuck is wrong with you? You know, like maybe it's that. I think that's the argument. I think that they. I also go on Callum's side of. I think that they could have done it better, and it does kind of come off a little bit more like. She happens to be a woman, and that's why he's doing that. The only argument I could see fighting against that, too, is that he does it for Q. Well, the argument, I guess, maybe in favor of what you guys are saying is there will be a scene when they get to the casino where he just like, yeah, yeah, men are talking. You know? <laughs> like... uh, he says, it's a tough business. You picked Miss Bouvier. Mrs. Bouvier! Mrs. Bouvier! <laughs> Simpsons reference. <laughs> Uh, leave it to the professionals. She says she's an army pilot, whatever. But here's one of my flaws. Bond asks for her help. He offers to pay her to fly him. They barter for the costs. And they end up with uh, she's kissing him. And he says, why don't you wait till you're asked? And she says, well, why don't you ask me? It's kind of a magic penis moment a little bit. It's uh, I don't like that they're instantly flirting. I don't get the feeling like this is let's lo- use our sexuality to win the argument kind of a thing. I think that this would have been much better in a different movie. Thank God we're alive. Sex is kind of the vibe I got. <laughs> I mean, I take the opinion that. All right. Hear me out on this front. I think if bond was to have been the one that would have been asserting it, then people would have been people at that time would have been more quote unquote okay with it because it fits Bond's character, but because it's Bouvier, this uh, Pam that's doing it instead, they kind of feel like oh that feels a little bit weird that they're just starting doing it straight away, and I just feel like yeah we know that Bond is a hound dog, but it doesn't mean that women can't be hound dogs as well. Like just she just sees a hot guy in front of her and feels like, yeah why not why don't we just do this now. <laughs> Uh, Because that's what Bond's attitude is in a lot of these cases. Why can't a woman do that as well? I I agree. I I thought this was fine. I like I even told Tony, I liked this pairing. There's flaws, but the flaws are mostly with the actors and not the character. That's, I guess, where I come in is I do think that maybe if it wasn't Carrie Lowell and Timothy Dalton, it might have been better. Yeah, because these two are very... Lim- I don't want to. I don't want to be too hard, but they come across to me as limited actors. I think that's fair. Funny so, enough, they actually got along really, really well, and like, 
I don't get that chemistry between them. No. Well, maybe, like I say, they got on together probably as friends behind yeah. the scenes. It's like, oh, yeah. We got... Whereas, like, this is supposed to them be in a more romantic setting. It's more, again, it's meant to be a bit more, I don't want to say tense or anything like that, but the fact is that these two don't know each other. And the only time that prior to the bar scene that Pam had seen Bond was during that meeting with Felix and she tried to get away from that mm-hmm. situation as quickly as possible. Yeah, maybe if there would have been like a brief moment of flirting there, maybe. that would have been better, I think. Maybe she just goes like, oh, hey, like, you know, he's kind of hot. Maybe I'll fuck him at the wedding kind of a thing. Like, you know, then I think I could, that's like a rewrite type of thing. I think uh, another pass on that would have been a little bit better. What you don't see is off, off screen, Felix's wife was like, hey, you totally should because I can't. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, I had him. He's great. <laughs> yeah. It's like those double O's stand for orgasm. <laughs> uh, Money Penny's had five typing errors on the first page alone. She's worried about Bond looking into his whereabouts, and she calls up Q Branch, and that's it for Money Penny. So I feel bad for this actress. Yeah, because I feel like she could have been a good Money Penny, but we really don't get anything of her. That's why so... she's like completely forgotten about when it comes to it, and. She's she's in two movies and only one of them she gets a scene with Bond. That's yeah. terrible. Oh well, yeah, it's just it, it's a nothing role pretty much. But yeah, yeah. This, this this felt to me like them almost writing off Money Penny. It's like okay, we don't really we just put her in there for fan service, but realistically we don't need her anymore. Now, if they would have done the third movie, I'm sure she would have been a more traditional part. Because the third movie, like, we have some ideas about what the third movie was supposed to be, but... Really? Um, so there was going to be another one mm-hmm. for Goldeneye? That's good. Uh, there was going to be a, a couple more, but... Oh, good. They only got, like, part of the way through the production for it, and then all the other kind of things hit. Um, Yeah, I, I feel bad about the Money Penny character, because she really doesn't even serve a purpose, and... She does. I mean, she, she sets up a whole big part of the plot, but just... The actress didn't get a chance. Carolyn Bliss didn't get a chance to do anything, and I feel bad about that. Bond's hotel room in Isthmus Ith- City is swanky as all hell, or as he calls it, it's adequate. It's like, goddamn, man. <laughs> like, this is like the best hotel room you could possibly get. And he asks for a case of Bollinger R.D. Champagne, refers to Pam as his executive secretary, Miss Kennedy, gets him, uh, her to sign some papers. He asks for some fresh flowers every day. The fresh flowers thing. Is it just uh, to kind of, I don't know, be like, uh, I'm rich? Or is there a purpose to this? I've always wondered if there's something that I'm not getting with that. Would you expect there to be? Like, I think he's just being a dick. Yeah, I think it's just just a case of him trying to throw his money around to try and demonstrate that aspect to them that he's super rich, so he'll get preferential treatment. I always thought that that was the case, but then I was always like, I wonder if there's something that I'm not clicking with about like that he wants that for to make sure that the room's not bugged or something like I I was always just sort of like, maybe there's something there. I don't know. But yeah, it seems like that's probably just the case. And he gives uh, Pam a big wad of cash, says if she's going to stay because he wants her to just leave. And this is one of the many times in the movie where he says, all right, your part's done. You can leave. And she says, no, I want to stay. Uh, he gives her a chunk of cash and he's just like, you gotta look the part, buy some decent clothes. <laughs> yeah, he fucking, <laughs> he really was just like, nah, all right, if you're gonna fuck this up and you're gonna stay, you better look the part. <laughs> like, you know, just... I mean, I mean, I was more uh, drawn to the line, we're south of the border, it's a man's world. Hmm. Well, no, but that follows immediately. Huh. Why can't why can't you be my executive assistant? He's like, yeah, yeah, I've met her talking. Get it, get, go away. <laughs> like, <laughs> then uh, Mark Ange Draco pops up and he goes, you need a real man to do this. <laughs> 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 and Bond goes, oh, okay, I'm not that bad. You know, that kind of thing. We get a little Bonko action. Yes. But no Sweevy. Different type of Bonko. Bonko de Isthmus. The big, uh, biggest bank in the area that Sanchez owns and he makes a deposit of it was a five million I think something like that yeah he's like uh you know uh, weekly deposits of the same amount and the guy's like oh of course you know this is real you know money grubbing shithead 
bank guy. I, I really like the casting of that guy. I, I immediately just want to punch him in the face. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> just, it, well, yeah, he's just um, a typical person that sees a rich guy coming in and just immediately changes his tune as he would do for any member of the normal public. Yeah. Um, I, I do like uh, Pam's entrance in this as well when she comes in the short hair and the the uh, dress and and or the, the the dress suit type thing and Bond just immediately catches his eyes like okay fucker you wanted me to look nice look at this now instead just, yeah she's I uh, thought she looked great I thought like she was really good looking for this film perfect eighties girl I with, really with the short this. hair and everything yeah. yeah I love this look uh, she looks great you know for my taste. Her top look in the film is right after this. The sparkly purplish gown at the casino. I think that's super flattering on her. Great job on the costume design there. Um, but it is kind of one of those, like, they had a shitty wig on her. And then you take the wig off and you've got her natural hair and she's got the business suit on. And it is kind of like, oh, wow. Okay. Miss Kennedy. Kind of thing. Like, you know. I love how these break down into like, yeah, we can talk about their hotness. But we can also like really compliment their beauty and their outfits and that you know, there's a lot of things to break down yeah i mean yeah. as far as the pure hotness scale i've got lupe higher uh yeah because talisa soto whew. i mean there's she moments also <laughs> also wooden actress i thought like some of her lines and some of the scenes she's in just kind of come across as like bland my favorite line of hers as far as delivery is when she says it took me 15 years to get out of there. I don't want to go back. I think that's her best line. Yeah. But uh, she uh, was in uh, Mortal Kombat, which by now, if you're listening to this podcast, we should have already recorded the Mortal Kombat podcast for the new film, which she's not in. Lisa Soto, I think uh, she's beautiful. And Pam, uh, Carrie Lowell, yeah. Apparently one of the grips or something, uh, like one of the, I, I don't remember if he was a grip or if he was a, a production assistant or something, but one of them was like the the nephew of like one of the producers or whatever was just like so taken by Kara Lowell in this movie that he just like kept forgetting to do his job. He was just like staring at Pam. Ah. <laughs> it's just like yeah. uh, kind of cute, actually. Yeah, so was some teenage kid or something is just kind of being like, ah, Miss <laughs> Miss Pam Bouvier, <laughs> like, you know, kind of. <laughs> Oh, we also get a scene, uh, Sanchez and his, one of his underlings, Truman Lodge, who I fucking love. They're having this casual business meeting. Uh, it, it's slimy as all hell. It's very indicative of the way that rich, corrupt people act. You got Truman Lodge being all nerdy with numbers, and Sanchez is charming with his jokes. You know, Our biggest problem is what to do with all the money and all this. It's like a one-two punch, good cop, bad cop kind of thing. Truman Lodge is a character that I think is so good because he is just, he's, he's eighties corrupt cokehead businessman asshole and he nails it. He could have easily uttered the words greed for lack of a better word is good. Or like, don't you worry about blank. Let me worry about blank. <laughs> right. Like he's <laughs> perfect eighties, like yuppie, Mm. kind of art of the deal kind of dickhead you know like the sniveling dickhead that you just are like can somebody boot this ass in the fucking forehead or something you know like i love truman lodge yeah his only interest is the is the money involved in all this thing and if anything uh interferes with that side of thing that's what pisses him off the most uh the rest of the time he's just your, your typical yes man type like very um I guess charismatic in these sort of environments, but otherwise you're just like, oh, okay, you just want to get, you just want to get paid as much as possible. It, yeah, it's he's a very, very unlikable character among yeah. a bevy of very unlikable characters. I say for my money, and we'll get to this when we talk about our roundup. I say that this has the best overall group of villains, except for one other movie. So I might agree with that. Which is the next movie? Yeah, Bluefeld's got a cat. Sanchez has an iguana. Yeah, he did, didn't he? Uh, he on the comment, yeah, on the commentary, <laughs> he's talking about it. And he's like, "Yeah, this iguana like really liked me." 
So I would just mouth words to it every once in a while, and I'd give it some kisses, and he's like, it didn't like anybody else, <laughs> really. So the iguana liked Sanchez, which it needed to do. But yeah, he gives it a little smooch. And, you know, I'm not an iguana guy. <laughs> Lupe wasn't an iguana girl. Yeah, well, yeah, iguanas are her best friend at the end of the movie. So. <laughs> we see this uh, televangelist as well, played by Wayne Newton. Which I always want to say Wayne Knight, but Wayne Knight's new, uh, Newman. Newman, Wayne Knight, Wayne Newton, it all throws me off. So instead of a scene where he says, Dodson, we got Dodson here, nobody cares. Instead, he is part of the drug business. It's a TV show, one of those like, can you raise money for this kind of thing, where they're doing a fundraiser where the amount that they charge and the money goal is what they're charging per kilo. So it's 22,000 from each of our meditation chapters, meaning it's 22,000 per kilo. And you get lines like the Manhattan chapter has given a pledge of $500, meaning that they want to buy 500 kilos. I think this is brilliant and just so fun. <laughs> and so in your fucking face of like the bullshit televangelist that just Bless your sucks. heart. Ugh, this is great. <laughs> As someone who's virulently anti-religion, it does warm my heart to see how much, <laughs> just to see you know somebody what? exposing how much bullshit this entire thing is involved. I'm glad that we can all come together and just sort of like, yeah, they nailed it because this kind of shit is just obscene. And and, and if, if anyone was to like dislike that reference, just, I'm all for spirituality, all for Absolutely. morality, all for that side of aspect of it. Uh, hate organized religion because those are people that exploit those aspects in people's uh, natural personalities. Absolutely. Like the put the hand over the person's head and go, "You are healed," kind of thing. Like, well, just anything. Like, just, just, just yeah. the church for Christ's sake. <laughs> like, all that stuff is <laughs> is just exploiting people's natural urgency to try and find purpose and meaning in life. The eighties are so interesting because. Every movie that gets into the 80s thing, whether it's a comedy or it's an action film or whatever, there's so much like cynicism to it. And I feel like we're heading towards that. Like we're in 2021, we're getting towards 80s stuff. And that might be why a lot of 80s things are coming back in style right now, because people are kind of feeling the 80s. I think we're going to get some really interesting movies in the next couple of years. I would agree with that. We're getting some of them now. I mean, some of them are just flying under the radar that are going to be like years from now. People are going to go, did you check out that movie? Did you check out this movie? That kind of thing. But experimental type stuff. And I mean, basically in the 80s, it's like consumerism is the worst. And like all these things that we were told in different time frames are kind of like being turned on their head. And even something like this, it's like in a Bond movie, we're getting criticism of organized religion and televangelism and stuff and it's a drug deal thing and it's just i fucking love it i love he got the part too because he just had reached out to them and he was like i love these movies can i be in one please and they were like yeah you can do that part kind of thing which i think he's so perfect for it too because i could see people especially like you know when you get like there's like the sad old people that like they'll call up and they'll buy stuff on like uh home shopping networks and and all that you get like yeah. a they can fall for like the scams i could see like old people donating to uh to wayne newton here being like well, oh like you know he's he's a nice guy and like i'd be a part of this like and the way it's used against him later in the movie yeah. is so good uh i like that the casino guy says bond's playing blackjack like a real jerk off <laughs> Plays like a real jerk off. <laughs> which, which is clever because they do the they he gets an originally a private blackjack table, and he says he's going to run up two hundred fifty k, and then he basically immediately loses that. Mm -hmm. He says, "Okay, I want half a million now," and so they basically have to call up Sanchez. So he now has Sanchez's attention, just up the limit as much as possible, and he says, but "Yeah, let's do it," because this guy's clearly losing his money. He's playing this like he's doesn't know what he's doing. And then Bond uses that and starts winning. Yeah, he wins so much more back. I think he's like up half a million or something. Yeah. And, then and Sanchez, Sanchez, for that matter, he's just like, let him play. Yeah. 
but then he sends Lupe in. And uh, Bond gets Pam to go get him a medium dry vodka martini, shaken not stern, uh, stirred, stern. Why do I say stern? Uh, stirred. Uh, I like that Pam does the little shaken, not stirred, and injects <laughs> a gesture to the guy. And then when they leave, she drinks a martini and she hates it because it's just like, well, not everybody likes the same type of stuff. And she's just like, Bleh. like, it's gross. I've never had a shaken martini. I've had one sip of a pomegranate martini in my life, which is not the same thing. But at some point, I'm going to order the exact same drink that we get in Casino Royale and see what awful taste this is, because I do not like the taste of alcohol at all. Any alcohol. I don't like the smell of it. I don't like the taste of it. So I'm sure I would think that this is just absolutely disgusting. How do you guys yeah, fall on that kind of side of things? Well, I don't drink alcohol either, so so I, I, I wouldn't t- I wouldn't taste it anyway. I've um some alcohol is good. Some of it's just really like, oh, why do people do this to themselves? But on the occasion, if you want to, you know, have a drink, I've never been against it. So I'd probably try some of these. Somewhere, some. I don't know, location, I'm going to be wearing a suit, and I'm going to be at a spot where I can order that, and I'll order it just to feel like James Bond. (laughs) I'm actually surprised, knowing how much you love this character, that that isn't more you, of just like, yeah, I'll get a, you know, not just drinking for the sake of it, but like a high-class cocktail kind of thing. I could see you being that kind of guy. If I wasn't so turned off by the smell and the taste of alcohol, I'm sure I probably would have been. But every single bit of alcohol that I've ever had, whether it's rum or beer or vodka or whatever, I always think it's just like, because I mean, I don't even like soda. I don't like carbonation. So even wine, I'm like, no. If I cook with white wine, I'm like, I hope that that smell goes away as soon as possible kind of thing. Like One of those things, you know. Yeah. And Lupe takes Bond up to meet Sanchez. They have this little back and forth. Bond says that he he helps people with problems. He's not a problem solver. He's a problem eliminator. Temporarily unemployed. They get a kick out of that problem eliminator line. What do you mean? Uh, Sanchez. He's just like, oh, I love that problem eliminator. Oh, problem yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought you were talking about like the writers or something. <laughs> um. I like that they use the fact that he's unemployed to kind of go along with this. And piece of shit Bond moment, which I'm sure you love, where Sanchez is like, well, if you want employment here, you got to kind of prove that you have something that these guys don't. And he's like, (laughs) oh, yeah, that's real hard, I bet. (laughs) Yeah, it's not going to be too difficult. (laughs) I like Sanchez's line, too. Nobody saw you come in. Nobody has to see you come out. He's always dangerous. And uh, I like that Bond's checked out that he's got some armored plated glass. Uh, and two people are spying on Bond, too. They come back a little bit later on. But I, I like the meeting scene of him just being like, because he could have tried to just kill him. But instead, it's like, no, let me get to know what's going on here. Let me try to warm myself up a little bit, whatever. And any scene that has Bond and Sanchez together, I love. Sanchez yeah, it's a- is really good. Yeah, it's a, it's a good um, Bond trying to subdue his urges to immediately kill this guy to just try and get himself in the perfect position to do so. Imagine like some other take of it where he's just like, I'm kind of a prominent eliminator. I killed my fucking friend. <laughs> <laughs> Starts choking him. Uh, Bond is told that his uncle has arrived and is waiting for him in his suite. Kind of a callback to the whole your wife is in the room thing from Live and Let Die. Again, another reference to Live and Let Die. And Bond's not expecting this because he doesn't have a fucking uncle. His parents are dead. They died in a climbing accident. There's a whole big thing. Immediately suspicious, he asks Pam for a gun and she rips off part of her dress. Pretty sexy moment that I like a lot. Shows off her legs. She's got a leg strap holster with a little gun and all that. And this was apparently based off of the dress that Talisa Soto wore for her uh, her um, audition. Hmm. And they were like, that's hot. <laughs> Let's put it in the movie. 
I think that that's kind of like the the top notch sexiest moment for Pam in the movie. I think I'd agree with that. And I'd say there's one moment later on in the movie. Is that when she goes, no! <laughs> I was just trying to think of any moment. <laughs> yeah, nothing sexier than the woman saying no. <laughs> uh, well, to Bond, I mean, different story. Yeah, covering uh, this franchise movie. Bond bursts in the room, and it's Q! I, it's when I texted you, oh my god, Q! I was like, I fully thought, okay, we're just going to get some... Some guy's going to be in the room, and there's going to be a big... You know, action sequence or something. Action sequence, and it's oh fuck, it's Q. Hey Q, like and he says he's on leave, <laughs> and he just wanted to pop over and check up on him because Money Fanny's worried, and he says a line that everybody puts in every compilation. If it hadn't been for Q Branch, you'd been dead long ago. Because it's fucking true. It is. That's going to be more of a poignant line in the future. There's a there's a little tribute thing. Uh, we'll get around to it when we get a couple movies deep. But um, Q, I absolutely love in this movie. Yeah, it was nice to see him in this environment where he's more on the field with Bond. Yeah, I do appreciate him. Obviously, I always love. Q being in part of any of these movies it just feels again it was a bit weird considering the scene earlier where essentially Bond is now being supposedly hunted down by MI6 in order because he's gone rogue or at least he's like completely a part of it now and then says oh Q just decided to turn up and he's conveniently on leave and he's got all these goodies that you can help Bond out with I almost felt like he would have been a bit more visceral and interesting if Bond had to do it without any of that stuff or have that stuff kind of used against him almost. I think there should have been a scene where M sort of just goes, oh, you know, Christ, let him just do what he does. If he dies, he dies, but let him just have his way. Wasn't and that just... the money penny scene? It kind of was, but I think he could have been more poignant with the line. Like yeah. he could have just said, you know, ugh. This guy, you know, like, just let him do it, I guess. Because Money Penny does get told, oh, well, you know how he is. He'll be all right. And then she calls up Q, which I love because Money Penny and Q are always better allies than M. And this movie just sort of solidifies that. He says he's got everything that a man would need on holiday. He's got an explosive alarm clock guaranteed never to wake up anyone who uses it, <laughs> which is great. He's got dentonite toothpaste. It's plastic explosive. Uh, oh, when Pam comes into the room, there's a little exchange that I really like where he says, Pam, this is Q, my uncle. Uncle, this is Miss Kennedy, my cousin. And Q goes, oh, we must be related. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Q's great. He's got Q. a... Go ahead. I'm gonna No, just like, we've still got him for a few more movies, but I'm really going to miss him. Hmm. Especially the last thing you're going to see from him. Uh, he's got a signature rifle. It's coded to Bond's hand, so nobody can use it but Bond. There's this laser Polaroid camera that I honestly actually don't like. It's the one that I'm like, you went a little too far here. Where the camera's got this... When you use the flash, this laser pops out and it destroys this picture of El Presidente. And the picture is an X-ray. I think that that's like... You could have gotten that one taken out. You know? I kind of feel like that in the 80s is the most realistic thing they could have come up with. They're like, oh, we could totally do this. You know? Are you thinking about the gadgets, Callum? Uh, I mean, they're not, they're nothing super special. I can't, I mean, the toothpaste is the only one to use. The alarm clocks, it's a funny line, but it doesn't actually get involved in any part in the movie, so it's just there for that line. Uh, the camera, the, the gun that's fit to his identification is the most interesting one but again it's only used really sparingly in one scene and then it's basically forgotten about afterwards so i can't really say any of the gadgets really at least the ones that q provided ended up really adding a lot of uh add, added a lot to the long-term part of the movie it was just they were, they were there they were usable for that one scene they needed to be in and then they were out of your mind 
And then we get that uh, they're all going to retire to their quarters for the night. Pam shuts the door on Bond. Bond's just assuming he's just going to sleep with Pam. And he's going to be in the same room with Q. (laughs) Hope you don't snore, Q. Fun little moment. I like that. I like it. Uh, Bond again tries to get Pam to leave. Gives her some bonus cast. And uh, I I think it's redundant when they keep doing this throughout the movie because it happens like four times. We get it. The no, I'm staying type of thing. I don't think you need to do it as many times. But again, one extra pass on this movie, I think, changes a couple of those things on the, the script. And um, Sanchez is having his meeting. Uh, drug dealers of the world unite. <laughs> like that line. It's just, you know, I like the bribery line, too. You know, well, in a word, it's bribery. And he goes, you took the words right out of my pocket. <laughs> Were you expecting that this was going to be when we got that pigeon again? <laughs> no. <laughs> what the fuck? That damn pigeon. <laughs> you, you knew it was coming eventually, so you've told us that there was going to be another pigeon involved in this. <laughs> so if he's going to quit scaling down a building, then yeah, it's probably going to be the, the pigeon <laughs> thing. We don't see the pigeon anymore. Uh, that's the end of the pigeon in the series. But, I mean, the pigeon's in more movies than... Uh, some characters that are like main characters. <laughs> he sets up this whole dentonite toothpaste thing. He's got the cigarette trigger explosives and all that. And um tells Q to leave. You know, hell of a field aid field agent and all. Quang. Or is it Quang? If you get that reference, let me know. Uh wants to see the lab. And Sanchez plans to take them to the main distribution center. We see El Presidente Hector Lopez, who is played by somebody that you might recognize. Do you guys have any idea who that might be? I don't. The movie count does. No, I didn't pay much attention, to be honest. He wasn't there for long, so. He is played by Pedro Armandares Jr. The son of Pedro Armandares Sr., obviously, (laughs) but... Uh, so I imagine that's Pedro Morales. Then. Uh, Pedro Armendariz Sr. was Karembe. Oh, right. Get out of here. That's cool. Yeah, they got his son to be uh, El Presidente in this one to just be like, hey, come on back and, you know, do that. So He it, it, it didn't have much lines or anything like that. To really yeah. say, so he can really fucked up his role that badly. I, I like that they, they brought him in there for that just to be like, Karembe was cool. We liked him so much. Let's get his kid to be a pop it up in this just for a little part. And he says that his check's only about half the amount as before. And Sanchez has another great line. You were very quiet when I was arrested. Remember, you're only president for life. Why would you want to be involved with these people? <laughs> God, anybody threatens me with that kind of thing. And I know that he's as fucking bad as he is. I'd be like, all right, yeah, I'm done. I'm not president anymore. I'm, like, you know, I'm going to retire, go to beach. Make it to where nobody, I'm not responsible for anything. No, because if you're not president, then they just kill you. That's true. Because <laughs> you know everything, and yeah. Yeah, fuck, fuck that. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great villain. So good. And uh, Bond sees that Pam is in Sanchez's place, and he's, he's talking to a guy named Heller. Ninjas grab Bond. <laughs> I didn't expect ninjas in this one, right? No. <laughs> uh, they take him back to this thing and they reveal that uh, the people that have been spying on him, they're Hong Kong narcotics and he just fucked up every bit of their sting operation. He, uh, They've been doing this for years and if they go to see that distribution center, they can really nab him and Bond spooked him. Fucked everything up good running theme of this movie is the more that Bond gets involved, the more other people suffer, like we've been saying. But I think it shows like, you can't just fucking go rogue because you feel like it even if you're James Bond. Like, there are rules and there's a reason you play by them. You can own space, nobody does it better, but you know. (laughs) Yeah, but I mean, that I I would get that being the lesson of this movie if Bond suffered any consequences at the end of it. Hmm. I don't think it's really like they're a lesson of the movie. I think it's just one of those things. It's like a side effect. Yeah. Mm. 
There are explosions Again, everywhere. Good. It was just that it just it's just something that makes Bond unlikable. Because he doesn't get any comeuppance at the end of it. Everybody dies except for Bond and the explosions <laughs> as well, too, you know. Uh there's a, it, it's kind of rough. There's the whole like don't let them take you alive thing where there's just like I'm just gonna jump out in front of them and they can shoot me. The the Quang does a cyanide pill. But it's it's weird because the one person that we see who's gonna be taking Bond back to London is this guy called Fallon. And I just feel like again, well, the thing that I mentioned earlier is that I didn't need too much more, but maybe we could have been introduced to him at some point in the movie about him being the one that's been tasked to look out for Bond and stuff like that, having like casing Bond throughout the casino and stuff like that without Bond mm. being aware that he's being spied on. I agree. I can see he that. Just, yeah. He just pops up in this and says, I'm here to take you back to London, pulls out a syringe, and then the whole building collapses and he dies. But great, great, great uh, MI6 agency have it. Basically, what I'm getting from a lot of these Bond movies is that Bond is the only one that really can do anything. Except 008. 008. <laughs> But yeah, again, it's just because like this agent, like your best agent has gone rogue, and you just send this randomer in here to just like, okay, I'm the one that's tasked to do back. Oh, the building just collapsed. Oh, I'm dead. That's uh, but surely, yeah, again, that would be the cool moment to do. Like, okay, Bond's gone rogue now. We don't have no idea. Like, our best agent is out there, and he could just do anything. Like, once Sanchez is done, what's he going to do next? Essentially, like, we can't just. Are we just going to bring him back? Is that the line that we're going to go along with? Is he going to be happy about that? We need to send Double OA out to deal with him. You could feel free to dismiss this right away, but cool follow up to this movie would have been Double O Eight goes after Bond, and yeah. that's the next movie. That totally wasn't their plan at all. But <laughs> and big twist: Double O Eight is a woman. Oh, I always thought that Double O Eight would have been fun as a woman too. They flat out say he in other ones, but they've had multiple Double O Twos and stuff. So yeah, um, I will say this is done. Uh, in a way that is slightly better, but just as problematic in some ways in uh, Quantum of Solace. But I do think it's done a little bit better in that movie. It's one of the few things. It's still a problem in Quantum of Solace, but it's... I'll give it more points than what it is in License to Kill, even though I'm still going to harp on it and say I don't like it in Quantum of Solace. But um, I do like that the fact that he was being tortured here makes... Sanchez and all them think that he was being tortured because he's on their side. I think that that's cool. Pretty convenient. Yeah, yeah, I'd say yeah. so. Yeah, that's a uh, again, it's a, another stroke of fortune for Bond where he's gotten a lot of other people who were actually trying to deal with Sanchez killed, and he's the one that benefits at the end. Of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's great with like uh, betting and gambling and all that. He's just lucky, you know. But he wakes up, and what the fuck? There's a statue of a fish with a human face. <laughs> Horrifying. I hate that thing. I don't understand I why they chose that as being the thing that Bond would say. I know what I'm getting you for. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm going to get you uh, a drug dealer who can come and attack. <laughs> that thing is disgusting. I don't. Whoever made that, no. <laughs> Just no. But he's at this beautiful villa outside of that thing. Uh, Sanchez is all like, hey, amigo, you know, what the fuck's going on here? Whatever. And I love how Bond plays this super cool. Immediately on the fly, he's thinking of a plan. He's like, that's a freelance hit team. They were afraid that I was going to warn you and spoil their plans. You know, I used to work for the British government. Uh, we got dossiers on these type of people. Somebody close to you on the inside is trying to kill you. Uh, <laughs> Sanchez is like, well, what? And he goes, well, I, I didn't get a name, but... And uh, Lupe, right beforehand, had said that Crest was going to show up tonight. So that fast, just right on the spot, quick thinking, Bond is like, oh, I didn't get a name, but, you know, it's just that somebody was supposed to be arriving today with a large sum of cash. And it, that's great. Showing how smart Bond is. Yeah. And then uh, there's a good little thing too. Heller's like, you know, you never believe who this guy is. And Sanchez, a uh, former British agent. Well, how do you know that? Well, I know things. <laughs> he just told you. You didn't really do anything special there. You know? But didn't he though? Uh, more or less than what um, Leonard Nimoy did on the monorail. 
<laughs> what do you mean your work here is done? You didn't do anything, <laughs> didn't I? <laughs> I love The Simpsons. Uh, Lupe's help, Bond escapes the villa. And I like how Lupe plays this all off. She's fun in this. Yeah. I, I also enjoyed her line of, oh, I'm going shopping. Like, <laughs> fuck off. Miss Lupe, no, senior Jen Chen still seem like <laughs> that guy's fucked. You know, he's going to be fed to the sharks. Poor guy. And back at the hotel room, Bond pulls a gun out on Pam. She explains this whole thing of why she was talking to Heller. Basically, what it boils down to, there's my line, is that uh, Sanchez has bought some Stinger missiles, and he's going to threaten to shoot down an American airliner if people don't back off going after him. Heller, who had supplied that, he will get immunity if he could get the Stingers back, but Bond's assassination attempt fucked that up, too. Boy, like, Bond is just the worst. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get the feeling that, of course, none of this would have worked out, quote unquote, for the better at the end without Bond, just because Bond is the one that's like pulling the triggers and doing these kind of things. But it's kind of like, well, you know, somebody probably could have been able to take him down in a more legitimate way. Maybe. Without other people dying. <laughs> you do get the impression that Sanchez... Is like, like we said earlier, he's one of these people that will kill and obviously use violent methods for people that fall out of line. But for the most part, he's just happy for people to do what they do as long as they're loyal to him and mm -hmm. they don't get in his way. So realistically, he probably wouldn't have felt the compel compulsion to do all these things. And as um, Pam says, like she was just about to get this deal sorted where these people wouldn't be at risk, like this commercial where line wouldn't be at risk if Bond hadn't have been so reckless with the way that he went after Sanchez. So realistically, Bond, now he's obviously had a few people surrounding him killed in the process. Now he's basically putting hundreds of people's lives at risk because he is so hell-bent on getting this person killed. Yeah, because if... Uh... It's not even the case of having killed. He wants to be the one that kills him. Yeah. And Heller was going to take the deal. So he would have gotten the Stinger missiles back and then... Sanchez probably would have killed Heller for going against him. So Heller would have died. Probably the missiles would have been sent back. Now, you can argue, wouldn't Sanchez have just found another way to get the missiles? Then it would have just been the same kind of thing or whatever. But it is kind of like the, when the way that she says it. She's like, there's more to this than your vendetta. Just you can't play this as if it's just some dude going to kill another guy. Like there are people involved. Sharky's dead, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Right. I like the moment on the boat where Bond, uh, when Pam is stripping off her clothes, Bond just sneaks a peek and smiles. <laughs> it's kind of like, oh, okay, <laughs> kind of thing. That's a, a little bit of normal Bond, considering we don't get all the normal sex and nudity that you would see. Yeah. He doesn't get to have as much, like, um, Charisma and charm and fun and playfulness and whatever when he's on a blood mission. But just for a moment there, when she's just taking some of her clothes off, he's just kind of like, mm, okay. <laughs> yeah. But I love this scene. Uh, Sanchez is talking to Crest about the whole situation. He says he, she's not going to, he's not going to lie in front of Lupe. And, you know, what is what happened with the whole guy stealing the, the money? And Crest sounds like a complete idiot. He's, ridiculous he's drunk and uh, he threw the pilots out and flew away and like a little bird huh okay and Lupe playing her part she's just like I didn't see any of this shit so Crest looks super guilty and Bond makes it even worse he hides a ton of the cash in the pressure chamber to frame Crest for being the guy who would have paid off the freelance hit team perfect setup so Sanchez tosses Crest in the chamber. He's like, you know, well, if you want the money so fucking bad, whatever. Turns up the pressure chamber and Crest's head fucking explodes. Uh, this... <laughs> Dude, it was like 2 a.m. when I was <laughs> this. And I just went, oh, oh, fuck. Oh, my God. <laughs> and then I immediately thought of Airheads and sent you a gift. <laughs> Of the Airheads commercial where the head explodes. I was not expecting this. 
Sanchez is fucking insane. <laughs> yeah, it's um I guess this is probably the most grisly death mm. of the entire franchise, at least so far. And yeah, it's just absolutely horrifying. And gotta give the people what they want though. But do they want this? <laughs> Oh, I love somebody it. Did. <laughs> I, I mean, I know, I know some people find this stuff interesting. Like, say, this is as you say, the RoboCop, uh, Terminator, uh, Die Hard era, and so there are deaths like this and things that are even more violent. And but again, you're going into a Bond movie, and if you if you are have like if this is your first Bond movie, then maybe this is something that would appeal to you. But if this is your You've you've grown up with the franchise, and you say, "Okay, I'm gonna go see the next Bond movie," and then this <laughs> comes up, you'd basically go, "Yeah, that's not anymore." I think for a lot of people, <laughs> imagine like you go, you start watching the movies with like your your grandfather or something, and it's like, yeah, you because know, at this point, a couple decades have passed by, and it's just kind of like, "Hey, grandpa, let's go to the movies." You know, we could see the new James Bond movie together, and it's like, "Oh, okay, Sonny, like we'll go." <laughs> that fucking explodes (laughs) like this is what you do the way that uh kananga blows up in live and let die where he doesn't turn into a balloon this is this is done the right way you see his head expand and pop and it's just like god damn so the only way i can compare it is comparing it to like wrestling like if you you could have generations of wrestling fans, but if your grandfather was a Hogan guy and your dad was an Austin guy, they're going to have trouble relating when you're like, oh, my favorite wrestler is Sasha Banks. And it's kind of like that here where it's like, these Bond movies, they're all supposedly the same continuity, but man... Moore and Connery are so much different than this, and this is so much different than, you know, Brosnan, which would be so much different than Craig. It, it all really kind of just depends on what era you grew up in. And, it, like, uh, even when it comes to something like Batman, for instance, if somebody grew up with the 60s show, their Batman is the, you know, kind of uh, doing some dancing and being all like, you know, Oh, we got to save the mayor from the penguin and, you know, uh, holy rusted metal, Batman, that kind of thing. And then you show them the Dark Knight Returns and they're like, this is terrible. This is this isn't Batman. Whereas somebody like me, I grew up with like Michael Keaton and Kevin Conroy and I watch Adam West and I'm like, this is dumb. <laughs> like, it was kind of like, what the hell? You know, I think West himself even said like it, the newer Batman are too grim. Right. right. So it really it all is generational, but this scene was just like, oh, we're not fucking talking about uh I wish they all could be California. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, this is the most brutal death, I think, in the entire series. Just because they show it. You know, it, there's other deaths where it's like, oh wow, he went through like a wood chipper. In uh, on Her Majesty's Secret Service, and it's like, yeah, you know, he had a lot of guts, and it's like, wow, that's pretty harsh. But you don't see him through the wood chipper, and then in this one, they're like, hey, we do that too later on, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. But the the head exploding to me is like that would be a moment too that I could see people being like, that's it, we're leaving. Mm. And to me, I'm just sort of like, his head bobs, like, goddamn. And even better, Sanchez, as if he's Bond with the quips. They go, well, what about the money? And he goes, launder it. <laughs> oh. uh, Sanchez is great. He is. I'd like to say I'd love to meet the guy, but no. <laughs> you know, it's, there's a difference. So then we get uh, Bond tells Q and Pam again to leave. And he sneaks back. He really the- is just like. Get out of here. Go mm-hmm. away. It's just a lot of, no, we're going to stay. And after the third time you've done it, I don't think you need to say it anymore. But he sneaks back onto the villa, pretends like he's never left. He's just in the nick of time kind of thing. Kind of like a Vita Will Kill with money, uh, not money, Penny, Mayday 
there you go. Didn't I w- kept saying money penny instead of mayday when we were doing that one? Yep. Doing it again. Um, Sanchez tosses him some money. Says thanks for the information. I got the guy who set me up and punched and <laughs> pushed at his luck. Only one guy. Ah, nobody would be stupid enough to take you on on their own. <laughs> like, nah, you got more people you got to kill for me, kind of a thing. Uh, Lupe wants to stay with Bond. Uh, he says it's not going to work out, and she's like, you know, well, why don't we try? And they fuck. So I think that this was completely unnecessary, followed up by the worst thing in this film. Go ahead, Denny. <laughs> Lupe goes to see Pam, or Miss Kennedy, as she thinks, and she tries to warn that Bond's in danger. And you don't understand. Uh, he didn't leave for, you know, he didn't leave out of the country. Last night he stayed with me. And Pam is upset. Q is like, oh, shit, this isn't good. And uh, Lupe has the line, I love James so much. That I don't like, because it's like, you can try to make the argument that he's the only guy that hasn't treated her like shit, but he's still kind of not super duper great toward her. This was awful, and I was so pissed off. I was like, what the fuck do you mean she loves him? Mm. They barely interacted, and like they fucked once. And like you mentioned to me, you're like, well, think about it. If somebody is treated like shit their whole lives, anybody that's remotely good to her will you know, immediately fall in love. But I'm like, no, this existed just to have the weird tension of like, Mm -hmm. which one is he going to pick? And Pam getting upset and going, the Q says, don't judge him too harshly. Field operatives need to use every means at their disposal. And she goes, bullshit. Because it's just, it's the, will they, won't they type crap. And yeah. And it existed just to push Pam as a strong female lead instead of it being like, no, maybe Lupe could have been the sacrificial lamb. I, I really think a lot of elements of this movie would have been better in that regard. Especially because uh, Sanchez should have been like, oh, you weren't loyal to me at all. Well, yeah, you're, you're dead, you know? I think that they could have gotten away with just the, you don't understand, last night he stayed with me. If you take out the I love James so much, I think it's better. Yeah, because that line was it was a step too far. But really, I think the whole thing was too far. I didn't even think they needed to sleep together, really. How are you feeling about that, Callum? I, I can get the arguments you guys are all making with that in, in these regards. I feel like she should be annoyed about that aspect of it. It's meant to show that she sees it more than just... It's it's more than just a fling with Bond from the way they got started, and she sees more in him now. I don't think we saw enough of that progression because mm-hmm. he seems to just be an arsehole towards her, but he's an arsehole towards everyone. So I guess maybe that's consistent. Um, the Lupe thing about falling in love with him, I can kind of see the the appeal to the argument that it's because he's treated her well, whereas other men haven't, and so she's just kind of it's more out of desperation more than actual affection. What I really would have liked out at the end of this scene, if we are going to put that scene into it, is that Pam should have fucked you. <laughs> the, Q would have been like, no, no, there's no time for that. Maybe later. <laughs> well, it's it funny about the idea, like, says, like, operatives have to do this sort of stuff in the field, and then Pam just, like, gets a, like, Puts a look on in her eye. Or something, like, yeah. She's like, what other gadgets you got in there? <laughs> Thank you. He's like, I got another uh, suitcase for everything that a woman would need <laughs> on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Hit the like button on the video, everybody. <laughs> so, you know how Q is always ragging on Bond for never returning his equipment back in pristine order? Uh-huh. <laughs> Uses it's a rake with a happen. transmitter, throws it the fuck away. <laughs> Just tosses it away frivolously. Q's feisty in his old age. Hmm. That was actually a suggestion by Desmond Lowell, and he was like, what What if Q just tosses it? Just like, let's have some fun with it. I like that a little bit. And all right, so next scene, we got Meditation Center here. Distribution Center is this cult monetary type of place that Professor Joe, the Wayne Newton, is doing. That's the cover, of course, that we've talked about earlier. But they, I like that he says... 
you know, it's just a cover, but he manages to turn in quite a profit too. So it's like, yeah, there are these people that are just like dumb and they're just passing money along to this fake monastery type thing. The hell of a set too. The big helipad with the fire emblem thing on it. I love the way that this thing looks. And uh, Truman Lodge jokes that they need to wear masks. COVID. To avoid uh, <laughs> their best customers developing a drug habit. I thought that that's funny. Uh, we don't want our best customers to get a dark drug habit. <laughs> you know. And he explains that uh, the way that they do this business thing is they dissolve the cocaine in gasoline so it's undetectable. They ship it in tankers and then they reconvert it. And Sanchez is like, you get to keep the gas as a bonus. <laughs> Hell of a deal. I think this is smart as hell. Yeah, which obviously means that it doesn't actually work. I can't imagine that it does. It means it, means it, doesn't, it wouldn't work in real life. Right, yeah. Because, I mean, yeah. if that's the case, then you would assume that everybody's just doing that. Which, I mean, yeah. gasoline is one of the biggest uh, markets that's out there. Maybe it is, you know? <laughs> Maybe somebody has a means to do it, but... Now, now the thing that I don't get about this aspect of the movie which is like bond's walking through with these people and then like dario turns to him and says like who's the new guy says someone i thought i could trust is there a scene missing i don't think he like, says it where, as... where scene where scene where sanchez finds out that bond is not who he says he is he no i just now be, be instantly distrustful of him i take it more as somebody that i thought i actually can trust Maybe it's like a delivery kind of thing, but like I've just killed Crest. I can't trust uh, it, like this one and this one and this one. And it's kind of like, well, that's somebody that I think I can trust kind of a thing. Cause he gets really angry later on. Well, cause I, no, cause I, um, I, I, again, I watch with the subtitles and then it says it's someone that I thought I could trust. Somebody I thought I could trust. Well, I mean, still you could say somebody I thought I could trust. Might be the delivery. No, he, no he's saying that in the Y is in, he doesn't trust him anymore. Says it's someone that I thought I could trust. In that he thought that oh yeah, Bond's on the level, but in the time between that scene they put, just had and now, he doesn't trust him anymore. I might have to check that back another time. But, I, I don't remember just, the just delivery of it. Yeah, missing because he's he's looking at him as in like because because Dario's the one. Uh, yeah, uh, Dario's the one that comes up to him and says like, "Who's the new guy?" And then he's just like, and then Dario puts a gun towards him. Yeah, because Dario doesn't trust him for sure. He's yeah. just sort of like I recognize this guy kind of thing. Yeah, but it's it's like uh, Sanchez sees he's been held at gunpoint by Dario and doesn't do anything about it. It's not like he's annoyed about it. It seems like that's what he wants. He wanted Dario to do. Hmm. I never I took it like that way. There's, there's, yeah, I just I just it doesn't look to me as if there was any good reason why he's now suddenly. Oh yeah, Bond is bad now. I need to deal with this guy. I always took the line as. It's somebody who I think I can trust. And then the switch doesn't happen until after Dario tells him that he's somebody else. What do you think, Rob? I I think it was more just like he already knows something is up with Bond because he's had his eye on him since the casino. So it was just naturally coming to a head. But I also think that's kind of a long-running problem in the films where it's just like there's so much that sometimes better plot points which could have used just a few more minutes of dialogue get rushed through we get a little bit with uh, professor joe total sleazebag who is totally taken by pam and uh they go to his private soundproof meditation chamber to bang (laughs) but she takes the keys from him and he says bless your heart See, this is the part I thought was the sexiest part of her performance, which was her getting on the bed and, like, pulling the dress up slightly and showing off the garter before then pulling the gun out afterwards. Fair enough. <laughs> I I love this scene. I love that Pam is just like, oh, my God, it's you. And I never thought, like, and he's like, yep, I got another one. This will be a great day for me. And <laughs> she just, you know, fuck off. Give me the keys. Yeah, here's a whole bunch Love of money, it. and I'm a beautiful woman, and we can, you know. I, I like it. that he he throws in the bless your heart though. <laughs> bless your heart. Yes. Oh, uh, there's a little joke. Um, Truman Lodge wants to save the burning building because uh, 
you know, when Dario says, you know, that that's a bond and everything, and they everything think it's set on fire. Truman Lodge says that it, it costs them $32 million, which is the budget of the movie. <laughs> that's why they chose that line. Just huh. like, you know, it costs us $32 million, that kind of thing. And Sanchez says he doesn't give a shit about that. He wants to save the tankers and the stingers. And Bond is strapped to a conveyor belt that's going to feed him into the cocaine grinder. This is a, a good part with Sanchez again. He says, when you're up to your ankles, you'll beg me to tell me everything. And when you're up to your knees, you'll kiss my ass to kill you. He is so like, ah, I love Sanchez. You don't want to fuck with that guy. Are we not? Bad. Well, like, we're not sure that he didn't have some experience in this field of drug dealing because he's really good <laughs> at playing this part. Well, that, but then Bond just keeps staring the shit because now he's even on the conveyor belt and he basically says like, "Hey, who else can you not trust in your organization?" Just going through everything, and then he mentions the Stinger missiles because he knows about obviously because. Pam told him. He gets, again, suspicious about it, tells him about Hella, so he's now, okay, now Hella's in my crosshairs. But he still decides, yeah, I'm still going to kill you anyway. Yeah, <laughs> he's learned better. He's just like, yeah, thanks for the information. Anyway, kill him. And Heller, of course, is like, oh, I'm just keeping them safe. You know, that kind of thing. Now, the part where Bond's hand, uh, the cables that, uh, that he's hooked onto, that he has him dangling, and um, Dario is trying to cut the cord. Del Toro accidentally cut Dalton's hand. <laughs> it was just like a real knife and real, you know, situation. So he just like fucked up his hand and they had to like stop and get him all stitched up and do the scene all over again and everything. And imagine like a young Benicio Del Toro is like, fuck, I just cut James Bond's hand during this, like, you know. And, uh, yeah, that kind of sucks. It didn't uh, seem like that was any kind of an issue, though. It wasn't like, you know, and then Dalton hated him or something. <laughs> like, it's just sort of, yeah, accidents happen, but... I do want to note that Sanchez, that whole scene where Bond is trying to save his ass, and Sanchez is like, yeah, thanks for the information. See ya. I haven't seen anything that good since Goldfinger, where he's about to kill him, and he's like, wait, but they'll send somebody else, and he's, like, basically pleading for his life, but trying to keep his his cool, and the guy just Sticks with it. No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. See ya. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really enjoy that because far too often these main villains are just like, okay, Bond might have me here, so I'll stop killing him and let him live. Or like uh, Blofeld and You Only Live Twice, which is like, I'm not going to shoot you. I want to walk down this hallway and then I'll shoot you. That kind of bullshit. He's just like, yeah. no, I'm just going to kick him and get him to fall down into the conveyor belt thing. And um, Dario goes, heh, you're dead. I never liked that line. And uh, Pam says, you took the words right out of my mouth and shoots him. But it really doesn't, she doesn't like hit him. I, I think that this is done kind of a clunky. Yeah. But better. I, Go ahead. I was going to say, like, she should just actually shoot him properly. Because I know she, she does get involved and she's helpful throughout the rest of the remainder of the movie but just she's there with a gun and she shoots and he doesn't actually suffer that much from it at all he's just going to get back up and go after her and bond is the one that is the one that ends up leading to his demise yeah if he so wanted what? her to have one of those moments of like a quip i think that she should have shot him and then said and he dies and then she says you took the words right out of my mouth yeah, either right. that or like you shoot him, she says the line, and then he staggers into what ends up being yeah. the thing that kills him. Instead, Bond just pulls him into the grinder for a vicious death. <laughs> yeah, again, it's just at this point, if you manage to sustain throughout the rest of the stuff, you basically go, Oh, fuck this, come on. <laughs> Turn the bloody machine off. Yeah, oh, are you all right? Watch the bloody that, machine oh, off. No, that's one of the worst things of this entire... I mean, the way that he says it is obviously how you would react, but her saying, are you all right? Yeah. He's dangling over a fucking crushed grinder. Of course he's not all right. It seems that, like... That line is so dumb. Because it seems like you just gotta make the girls always seem kind of stupid, don't you? We're in the middle of a Russian airbase in the middle of Afghanistan. <laughs> like, yeah. it's not full Tiffany Case, but, you know, you just... 
she's smarter than that. No, he's not fucking all ranked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, instead of him saying some kind of a line, though, I like that it's just like, shut the fucking machine off. Like, god damn it, right, Pam. He like, you know, to be like, oh, I'm hanging in there. Or something. Right, like, yeah. Turn the damn thing off now. Like, uh, it's just, uh, you know, the daily grind. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's just like, shut the goddamn machine off. I'm about to fucking die here. And Heller gets fucking impaled by a forklift, rammed into the building. Yeah, it goes through the wall like a fucking um, <laughs> uh, Kool Aid man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sanchez and Truman Lodge escape. Um, and we get another cute little moment where Pam steals the money back <laughs> from Professor Joe, and he's just like, "Bless your heart again." <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> this guy sucks, but, but I, I'm okay with it. <laughs> I like that he's not really all that mad. It's like, ah. all right. Oh, Bless what your heart. Angel. Yeah. At this point, Bonds facilitated Sanchez killing Crest and Heller, losing hundreds of millions of dollars. His lab's blown up. <laughs> kind of evening the odds a little bit here, you know? But he's still not dead, and so Bond must continue. <laughs> yep. Cue yep. the tanker chase scene with oh. some moments of bad green screen. Some moments of bad green screen, some moments of completely, like, impossible acts of physics involving trucks and tankers and all this other stuff. It's like going back to an actual, you know, Bond movie. <laughs> but it's so outside of the tone of everything else we've seen prior to it. Did you guys, because I know that you guys don't pay too much attention to the music, so I, I would assume the same thing when it comes to the sound design. Did you catch the Bond theme? Maybe, uh, but it's not like calling to my attention right now. Is it because you're yeah. a transformer? <laughs> I, 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 I just, I kind of imagine that enjoying this sort of scene that is going in the background, I didn't notice anything oh, fuck. different about it. I think we might have you back on there, uh, Rob. We might be able to hear you better now. Uh, how about that? Am I good now? Getting there. All right. So. The bullets ricochet off of the tanker and it goes dun 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 dun. And they do it, um, another little part where it goes, uh, da 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 da. Just fun. You know, they were like, ah, oh, fuck it. Let's have the bullets play the Bond theme. I tried to find a little clip of it online and everybody, the clip is like, uh, like somebody tried to rescore that part with their own music and stuff that I can't find like the quick clip, but yeah, if you, um, if you click on it, it's at, uh, towards the very, very beginning of the tanker scene when bond is still trying to like grab onto like the, the bottom of it and stuff. It just plays like the little, you know, do 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 or something like that. Like, it's just a cool little bit of, um, ricochet sound design, uh, sound design stuff. We get, Sanchez trying to fire a stinger missile at the tanker that Bond's driving, and Bond somehow manages to get the tanker up on one side, so the missile goes underneath and hits the other tanker. <laughs> and he lands uh, on top of another car for extra little bit of flair. It is a little over the top, and let's do the old Bond shtick kind of stuff. Bond yeah, releases the tanker back down. Of course, it falls right in front of three other ones, and you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's yeah, it's just it's way too jarring from the tone that you set throughout the movie. Because you can kind of again, you can compartmentalize it because it's a Bond movie, but then you've basically been training your audience that this is a different Bond movie. This is a different way we're doing it now. This is more serious. This is more gritty. This is more violent. And then you do that, and you just go, well, what, what, what do you want? What, what are you actually giving to us here? I really like the Truman Lodge stuff. Oh yeah, him being killed again. But it's just like <laughs> fucking hell, man. This is like this. The the tankers are gone. All the money is being lost to here. It's just he like, says, uh, just... "Well done, France. Another eighty million dollar write off." <laughs> yeah, and just, and just again, it's like, to be fair. I think like it's part of the reason why I like um, him so much is the idea is that he's got so many more quips than Bond has throughout the movie. But it's just like, okay, well, we better start making some overheads then. <laughs> yes, yeah, start cutting <laughs> some overheads. <laughs> <system. laughs> 
like he at the end of the day, he, if he wasn't a villain, he'd be a better Bond than Bond is. He did the screen testing. Did he? He uh, Dalton wasn't available, so when they did the screen testing for I, f- I don't remember if it was uh, for Pam or Lupe, but he was the one that filled in for Bond, and that they were like, you know, in a different world, he could have been a good Bond, kind of a thing. And yeah, I, like I would love to see that screen test, just to see uh, Davi playing Bond, because he's so charming. Even a line like yeah. that, just I guess it's time to start cutting some overhead. <laughs> just like. <laughs> It's kind of, he's one of those villains where it's like, I'd be okay with Sanchez coming back, kind of a thing, you know? Like, I mean, yeah. not at this point, but you know what I mean? <laughs> you have to add weirder stuff. The Bond theme's in full force. It, it, he gets the truck to pop a wheelie. I don't like that part. It's just a little, that's, come on, you know? Yeah, because like, I don't get it. It's just, like, okay, he's, he's, um, his path is blocked by a bunch of fire. And so I can, again, we've seen uh, parts of the movie where he's got the cars to drive on one side. So mm-hmm. you, if you've seen past Bond movies, you can get that side of it. But then you just, okay, I'm just going to pull the front end of this uh, truck up and drive forward. It's like no car has ever done that ever. Right. There's, it's impossible. It is physically impossible for the heavier part of the truck to go up when there's nothing on the back of it. I think that the leaning on the side and dodging the missile that's the moment you do that one and you're good this one goes too far because it, it's impossible there's no way in hell that can pop a wheelie and it doesn't even lead to something that i think is worth it because it's basically just the shot of it going through there and the other car goes through and the fire engulfs them and bond eventually leaks out gasoline and then that sets that car on fire and then that car flies off a cliff and almost hits pam's plane and it's just like we could have just had a shot of the car almost hitting Pam's plane. We didn't need the fire bit and all that. Yeah, I agree with that. Brake lines cut with the machete, all that stuff, and Bond and Sanchez go tumbling off the road with the tanker. Bond's beat well, the shit. Enough, it didn't explode on first impact. Yeah. On the ground. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's not Connery. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, the other two tankers exploded. I know they collided with each other. They exploded immediately. Yeah. Those were the ones that were rigged with the uh, the quick explosion thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's how they reconvert it, you know? Bonds beat the shit worse than we've ever seen him. Easily. He's just a wreck. But not but not as we will ever see him. Right. Yeah, eventually we're going to get to the point where everybody, you know, if you're watching License to Kill, you can go, oh, Bonds beat the shit. Once you get to Casino Royale, every guy in the theater goes, uh, uh, no, uh. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's just across auditoriums, across the, the globe, every guy just kind of winced, <laughs> you know, kind of moment. <laughs> and uh, Sanchez has a machete to him, and he says, you know, you could have had the world, and Bond says, don't you want to know why? And that split second of just hesitating, because Sanchez would be like... Who the fuck is this guy? Like this dude just pops up and he's like dropping money in my casino and then all this shit happens and whatever. So he shows him the lighter, shows him the engravement on that, flicks it and the giant flame catches Sanchez on fire and he blows up with a tanker. (laughs) And that's actually Dalton running away from a giant explosion because they didn't have a stunt double. (laughs) So they're like, let's run. (laughs) I like it. Awesome. One of the better villains, one of the better villain deaths to this point. Thumbs up yeah. all around. Yeah, I like the lighter being used to be the thing that actually ends up killing him. I just, I kind of wish we were reminded of it a little bit more in the movie. Would have been better if Felix died. I'm just going to, you know what? Would have been better if Felix died. So there's uh, a deleted scene where Bond. Uh, is just kind of like smoking in his hotel room and watching I think it's Sanchez on some kind of TV in some fashion. I, I don't remember exactly what the deleted scene is, but it's kind of one of those scenes where you do get a call back to the lighter and they just deleted it because they were like, well, we don't need this. Yeah, I mean, it kind of feels, I, I, I would have kept that in just because it feels like it's it comes out of nowhere again. It's like, oh yeah, I remember that from the like the fifth minute of the movie. 
Yeah, it's uh, I'm usually one of those people that says keep all the deleted scenes unless it's something stupid like the um, the magic carpet thing. But like, you know, if you watch Batman v Superman Ultimate Edition, it is a far better movie than Batman v Superman. And the Jack Zack Snyder four hour cut of Justice League is a far better movie than the Zack Snyder cut uh, that the uh, Joss Whedon so cut. So much fucking better. Please go check out that review that we did. So I'm sure if I watched like the 48 hour version of Lord of the Rings that I would like it even better too, for instance. But then again, if the if the extra scenes are just more this is Biffle and Sniffle and Wiffle and you know, then then I don't fucking care. But yeah. Hobbit sucks. So does Last Jedi. Anyway, uh <laughs> I had to put it in there. So uh. we, here's something I don't like. Uh we cut to Bond talking to Felix. He's in the hospital. He's recovering. Both his arms are okay, it seems. And that's fine. But why is he in such good spirits? Because Bond goes, oh, you know, I'll see you next week. We'll go fishing. And Felix is like, good, I'll be out of the hospital by then. Like, that kind of thing. Like, dude, you got your leg bitten off. Your career is done when it comes to that. Your, your wife, wife died dead. on your wedding day. And was raped. If, if this happens to me and Caroline, I'm not being all like, hey, bud, let's go fishing a few days later. Because remember, it hasn't been a whole lot of time. It's not like this is months later. This is probably a couple days. And it's like. I'm, no. I don't know if I'm in that position, I'm probably like, yeah, I'm just going to go kill myself when I get home or something like, you know. Yeah, he, he should be more somber about it. Or Bond should be like trying to console him and stuff like that through the phone. It's just like, yeah, OK, I'll talk to you later that type of thing and you could just... do a, a scene of this where he says like i'm gonna see you in a week and uh felix could just be like yeah that'd be great like i'm glad you're okay kind of not like good i'll be out of the hospital we'll go fishing we'll have some fun <laughs> mm -hmm. maybe they haven't told him that Stella is dead <laughs> that's, that's, that's even worse he's like what happened to my leg and they're like we'll find it <laughs> Where's Stella? Uh, she's off on her oh nice honeymoon. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, we'll go fishing. Well, not with Sharky, because he's fucking dead, too. You know? Yeah. You can use Sharky's fishing lures, maybe. I don't like it. I like that Felix isn't dead. I think I that they I think that they could have killed him off. But I think that the biggest problem. And I'm going to call back to this when we talk about Goldeneye. Felix doesn't show back up again. Until they reboot the series. So you could have killed him. So they could have killed him. And I think that maybe they could have had Felix in the next movie if they would have gone with the next movie the way that they were planning. But there's a character in the next film that is kind of Felix. But he's not. And I think... You missed an opportunity there. You could have at least had Felix pop up and be some guy that Bond calls up and he gets some help with him and Felix is wearing like a prosthetic leg or something. I I, I think that that's a missed opportunity. I don't know. But he I says agree. that M's called and he wants Bond back. <laughs> so there's our quick like, you know, next film, Bond's going to be 007 again. Kind of thing. I... As far as like this full on ending scene, again, I don't think they needed to push Lupe and Bond that hard. And yeah, she's she's the one hosting the swanky party at the villa, which I'm assuming it's just like hers now. And she kisses Bond and Pam is all upset, so she runs off. And Bond jumps over the ledge into the pool. And he grabs Pam and he kisses her and we get a call back from earlier. She says, why don't you wait till you're asked? And he says, why don't you, uh, so why don't you ask me? And the camera pans over to a fish that winks. <laughs> yeah, it's, again, the relationship they developed had wasn't strong enough. Yeah. To make it so urgent that Bond had to do that type of thing. It doesn't feel like a big feel good. Oh, they finally got together at the end type thing after that little distraction. It's just like. Yeah, but, I mean, they were together for a while, and then Bond fucked another woman, and then <laughs> and then decided, yeah, I'm not going to fuck that other woman again, I'm going to fuck you instead. And that's hmm. like, oh, wow, that's, a, that, that's oh. a true love story. Would have been like, made all the more better if they just didn't have him fuck Lupe. 
it's, it's a classic story. Boy meets girl, boy and girl uh, have sex after about five minutes after meeting. Uh, girl falls in love with boy. Boy basically is very standoffish towards her. One fucks up. Uh, boy fucks other woman. Other woman actually falls in love with her. The other woman's upset about it. That's like um, every Nicholas Sparks book, right? <laughs> yeah. Braun rejects other woman for no reason other than the fact that he just wants to fuck other woman. <laughs> That's basically the entire story. So, I, for a long time, the last thing in a Bond series was a fish winking. And then the end credits. I was like, and the song is, um, it's the love theme of the movie, If You Asked Me To by Patti LaBelle, which became an even bigger hit when Celine Dion did a cover version of it. I like both of the songs, but it's kind of low on my Bond theme list because it's not like it's as prominent as the love theme from The Living Daylights, where you hear it every time that it's like Kara. So, right. and I just don't like the song as much. I like uh, If There Was a Man more than if you asked me to, but I have both versions of if you asked me to in my collection, because I do still like the song. And like I said, for the long time, this was Bond's final mission. Him quitting, be, getting offered a chance to return, but we, he doesn't say, yeah, tell M I'll be back at the office, whatever. It's just kind of like, okay, well, we'll take care of that another time. His buddy is uh, out of commission. He's gotten revenge on him. You could play it off that he's wound up with somebody tough like Pam. I can kind of see that being an okay ending. It's certainly not the best. It's not at all what I would have my James Bond finale be. I don't know exactly what that would be. I haven't planned that out yet, but I know that it wouldn't be exactly the way that this plays out. But I could see some people being like, okay, that's if the movies and then the last story is Bond going off on his own and avenging his friend and killing a drug lord and ending with a tough army chick. Again, not at all what I would do. In fact, I would maybe even make the case that Bond needs to die. But um, that, that Gallen was it. Would make that case, you, <laughs> at least Timothy Dalton does, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, yeah, that that'd be a more need of an instance of rebooting the series with Brosnan instead. But yeah, I just I just feel like this Bond is, let's say, it was unlikable. So I don't think there would have been as much. And maybe it would have been a bad, bad time to kill him because no one would have really, I don't say really cared, but it, would have, it wouldn't have generated the kind of upset response that you'd want to. Like, oh my God, where's this franchise going to go? I'm sure there'd be a lot of people who'd be kind of like, yeah, good. I am very, very nervous that Craig's Bond is going to die. I'm fine I if it know. means it's going to be rebooted. I don't think it would be. I think at this point they could play off killing Bond as like, and he was a great character, but he's a, as we'll hear in the next movie, a, a dinosaur relic of the Cold War, and he's dead now. I'm concerned that in No Time to Die, Bond is going to die, and the new 007, Lashana Lynch's character, that they're going to try to make her the character going forward. Not James Bond, but that they're going to go, well, the series isn't just about James Bond, it's about 007, and it's like, no, it's not, it's about James Bond. Yeah, but I, I, I have to say that, even if that scenario which i don't think is going to happen would happen you know it would fail mm -hmm. and then they'd go back to james bond so there really right. is no difference anyway i just don't want to see a movie of okay spin off 007 is because i i might really like nomi in the movie she might be a great great character but then make a nomi movie don't make her 007 that's like that you know I we're gonna have to see when it comes down to it because eventually this movie's gonna get released even if it's like 15 years past the point that it's supposed to come out I wish that they would have done more of you know we used to be at a time frame where somebody could pump out six Bond films in the span of a dozen years and with Craig it's like it's pulling teeth but they were going to do a third film with Timothy Dalton it was at least for the working title it was going to be called The Property of a Lady which I don't think that they would have ended up using because they already used that phrase in Octopussy. But there was this whole different kind of plot. They were going to go try to go back to the Chinese side of things. There was um, another thing that I, th I read in one thing that was supposed to be a little bit about some of the stuff that kind of got brought into GoldenEye, but not necessarily. It wasn't exactly the same sort of thing. 
but they were fully planning on making another movie. And then a whole lot of things got in the way. A lot of people write it off as people didn't like this Bond, like Dalton himself, or people say that people didn't like that License to Kill was too gritty or that it didn't make enough money. It's actually a whole lot of other things. Uh, Mostly legal issues. They had a whole bunch of problems with MGM, with the rights to the character and those uh, legal battles that they had before with Thunderball. And everything got in the mix a little bit too. And a lot of just like production bullshit. Cause MGM is like, well, we got the rights to the character and other people are like, yeah, but are you producing things? So they couldn't, they literally couldn't do a movie because they were tied up in legal stuff. And along the way, Richard Maybaum, who wrote most of the films or at least co-wrote most of the films, he dies. John Glenn, who directed the past every movie from like, uh, for your eyes only in the past ones he moves on he doesn't want to do it anymore so they would have had to find a whole new director to do this this is the last time that we'll see robert brown as m i think that he died uh, a little bit after this movie came out carolyn bliss who is money penny doesn't show up anymore morris bender who does the opening credits he dies like the year after this cubby broccoli retires so the main guy producing these films is like I'm I'm too old for this. I can't do it anymore. And then Dalton's contract expires and by the time they got around to starting to do the the new movie it was like 92 and he was like look enough times passed by. I'm I'm too old past this and you guys should just start new. So it's just kind of like it's a changing of the guard in every way. The only person who carries on from this is Michael G. Wilson. Well, Q's in the next movie as well, isn't it? Well, I mean, as far as like production side, like, uh, like you get the director that's been doing them, the guy who does the opening titles, the, we don't have the guy who's doing the music anymore. We don't have, you know, like any of that kind of stuff. The main producer, the, the bond is gone. Funny enough, they were going to get John Landis to do the next movie. (laughs) Imagine the guy who did Animal House and Three Amigos and Coming to America and Blues Brothers and Trading Places doing the next Bond film. Seems kind of weird. It feels like it would be a fit for a certain type of Bond. The Roger Moore type, yeah. (laughs) I almost feel like, again, it it, it is difficult to imagine just all that, that, those elements of Bond that have been so crucial to its development going forward just disappearing. Mm -hmm. But I almost feel like it was a blessing in disguise. In a uh, considering the next movie. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, considering how good the next movie is. And again, how we talk about the, the Brosnan and Daniel Craig errors. And for the most part, we get like positive outlooks of it, but I feel like we needed, we needed people that had, that wanted to do a bond movie rather than people that felt like who were so tied up with the bond movie and trying to find ways of making it fresh and trying to do that. Sort of thing. we needed people that, appreciated the bond movies growing up and so wanted to do something with it maybe take it in a slightly different direction or do their own little interpretation of it but for the most part would just revered the actual movies themselves like because they'd grown up with them or anything along those lines and so wanted to put their own spin on it but again be very true to the source material or the stuff that we, they'd seen prior to i'll bring up the movie series that i tend to bring up on these podcasts i love todd mcguire he did not want to do Spider-Man, though. And the third movie shows, they were just sort of burned out. And even though I think the, the Garfield ones get a lot of flack and the Holland ones now are great, but you at least had people who wanted to play Spider-Man. And I think that Dalton, while he brought his own flavor to this character, was initially like, all right, well, I'll play it if. I can play them like this because I'm not playing any of this hokey bullshit that you guys do. And they probably would have gone more in a comedic direction too, because there were some people that were like, all right, you went too far. So they probably would have overcorrected and it probably would have been goofy. And then that would have been like, he would have been miserable and it would have just been a couple years past the point where people would have been like, well, why did you, why didn't you start something new? Cause it's like six years or so. 
And now it was Lazenby whose agent told them, "Ah, Bond is a thing of the past," right? Yeah, all the way back in that film. <laughs> like maybe we're hitting that point for real at this time, where it's just sort of like, how can we fit Bond in this era? You know, he is very misogynistic and things like that. I don't know. It seems like maybe it was best just doing what they did and leaving it for over half a decade and then coming back with a new guy. Also, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Yes. And when you get that License to Kill is the last Bond film and then years go by and usually by that point you're like, well, we would have gotten one or two Bond films by now because it used to be between two and three years. So if like six or so years go by, you're like, well, crap, we're missing out on two Bond films here. And then when you see the trailer for Casino, I'm not Casino Royale, for GoldenEye, that trailer for GoldenEye is one of the best. And it starts off with just this like kind of rhythmic, like uh, mysterious version of the Bond theme. And it's like, Bond, uh, Brosnan walks up and he goes, well, you were expecting someone else. And it's just kind of like, that's a moment where if you're in the theaters, you go, fuck, Bond is back. Like that kind of thing, you know? Whereas with this one, yeah, there are people that are like, oh, it's too too harsh. It's too gritty. It's too this. It's too that. It's, you know, maybe if they would have done the third film, it might have been one of the worst or something, even though I'm a huge fan of both of the Dalton films. But we never got to see it. And I, I'm curious what other elements that they put into the other movies. I, I need to do a deeper dive to try to figure out what more was like the plot of the property of a lady, which should never be the name of a movie because they already used it. So don't do it. But let's round things back up here. Let's talk about the different things. Music side of things. To me, it gets a thumbs up. I know that Callum's not as big on it, but uh, I'm assuming that that's a thumbs down for you, Callum, on the music. Yeah, because I predominantly listen to the theme music, and I think the theme music just doesn't fit. So, yeah, thumbs down. I'm going to give it a thumbs up, but it's one of the weaker thumbs up after spending, like, the last two podcasts we did. All I wanted to do was be like, <laughs> the AHA song is great, Duran Duran is great, I love the music here. I also really like Make Michael Kamen's score. It is very 80s. It's exactly the type of thing that... If you hear like some of the music, like the saxophone type of stuff and whatever, and then you hear the Lethal Weapon soundtrack or the, in some ways, the soundtrack for like things like Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves and whatever. If you dig that vibe, then License to Kill is another soundtrack that you would like to. So the current rankings for the themes are I Have a View to a Kill, number one, Diamonds Are Forever, number two, Living Daylights, number three, and License to Kill, number four. Rob has Living Daylights, View to a Kill, Goldfinger, and Live and Let Die. Callum has Living Daylights, Diamonds Are Forever, View to a Kill, and Goldfinger. So I haven't quite figured it out quite yet, because Goldfinger is my next one after License to Kill. I'm assuming the mathematical ranking at this moment is Living Daylights at number one, a View to a Kill number two, either Goldfinger or Diamonds Are Forever at number three, the other one after that, and then then it's kind of up in the air because then it's a matter of license to kill live and let die and the spy who loved me. So then it's, that is a whole other thing. Actually, then it might be you only live twice. It might be the next highest ranking. So I will eventually figure out when we get to the end of this, I'll figure out what our mathematical rankings are for a lot of these things. I figured out kind of the, the way to do that. So just to give you guys a little update on that. On the Bond girls side of things, we got Pam, we got Lupe, and we got Della. I I like them all. I don't think that they're all perfect, but I think Della serves her part. I think Lupe is... Where do I have Lupe on here? I have Lupe at my number one, two, three, four, five, six. I have Lupe at seven and Pam at eight, if you count Money Penny. Right now, I have Pam at, at number two, if you count Money Penny, and number one, but I'm definitely going to change her especially after this conversation it was just like yeah there there are some plot holes that i can see now i don't know where i'm gonna put her just yet though 
If you include Money Penny, I have Pam at ten and Lupe at fourteen. Lupe is underneath Solitaire for you. Mm-hmm. Where's Pam? Uh, uh, Pam's between Mayday and Aki. Mm-hmm. Thumbs up, though. Yeah, I'd overall, they're good. I'd yeah. say so. Major thumbs up, I think, on the allies. Uh, yeah. Even though Money Penny doesn't get much, and M is kind of you know whatever he is, Q in particular is just great, and I this is my favorite Felix out of all of the different Felixes. It's not exactly the like the exact way I would have done the Felix character in some way. I I like the Doctor No Felix as like another Bond or really the Thunderball Felix, but I like David Hedison and. The only one who I think can match him is Jeffrey Wright, but we'll get into him. I like Sharky. I think he could have been Quarrel, but I like Sharky. Hawkins is okay for his part. You know, thumbs up for me. Yeah, they were probably the best assembly of allies and villains for what I saw. They were all good. They all played their role very well. This is my favorite Q movie to date, just because... He just sort of shows up because he's worried about Bond, and I appreciate that. Uh, personally, I think that the entire Allies leans heavily on Q's performance. So it's a thumbs up, but it's only on the strength of Q's performance. Big, 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 big thumbs up on villains. Yep, I'm completely in agreement with that. Heller, yeah. Killerful, uh, Heller, Killifer, Crest, Truman Lodge, Dario, and Sanchez. That is a f- fantastic group I do think Dario kind of falls a little short Heller and Killifer are, are there for you know their little parts but Crest and Truman Lodge and Sanchez in particular to me I think are just fantastic Sanchez is as I stated earlier the best villain I've seen since Scaramanga and he just so good he matches bonds sadism and his quips and that's the better villains i feel the ones that are just toe-to-toe with bond does he rank above or below scaramanga i'm trying to think about that right now i really enjoyed the man with the golden gun but i think for what this film was i think sanchez was better so right now i'm gonna put him at number one number one for you number one for callum right now right Right above uh, Kananga and Scaramanga. He's the he's the best part of this movie. He's incredibly charismatic. He's brutal, vindictive. I'd say again, part of it, part of the um, I guess issue that I have in this movie is that he's because he's so good. It highlights Bond's deficiencies even further. For me, he was like I think that Della line really <laughs> sums up Bond as like. All right, he's kind of wooden. I, uh, it's gonna, it's gonna come across bad now. To say this, especially because I know what Tony's opinion is, but it's I really fair bond. Worst, I think Dalton is the worst bond. I figured at least somebody on this uh, panel, uh, it would be one of the two of you, would feel that way because that that's what happens with uh, Dalton. Dalton is very divisive. Like uh, people love or hate him. It's just one of those kind of things. He isn't perfect to me, but he's got something to him that I really like. And Dalton is, it depends on my mood. Dalton is either my favorite Bond or he's my number two. With Brosnan being my number one. Because it's kind of like, if I could take Brosnan's charm and acting ability which I don't think that Dalton's a bad actor. I've seen him in other things and he's great too. But I do think that if you take the brutal side of Dalton and the charm of Brosnan, then you get kind of the perfect bond. And Craig tries to do that, but I feel like Craig misses out. Like he just doesn't, he doesn't do either of them as well as the other two do to make it to where he matches them. Also, I don't think that Craig has the look for the part as much. And then that gets into Connery and whatever. My least favorite Bond is Lazenby. And then 
then I put more and then I put Connery and then I, yeah, that kind of a thing. But, um, I'd have to really think about it. Uh, like I said earlier, I don't know if I stood this on air or off air, but like Lazenby is slipping down. Whereas I was a really big fan of him at first. Now that the other bonds haven't acknowledged the change and stuff like that, it kind of makes Lazenby seem like more of a one-off. So he might be the least. And then, it might be Lazenby, then more than Dalton, then Connery, because Brosnan's spoiler, Brosnan is Bond to me. The end. Oh, and uh, Sanchez is my number two villain, by the way. The only one that I have above him is the Blofeld from From Russia with Love. Which is funny because I have him between the Blofeld from From Much With the Love and the Blofeld from Thunderball, which is almost the same character. But I've got, I'm like splitting the difference kind of. It's like, all right, you got two Blofelds and I'll give Sanchez the one under, underneath that. But Sanchez is definitely, there aren't many villains. I mean, for anybody who's trying to keep track, these are the main villains that we have left. We've got, uh, I won't spoil it. Um, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight primary villains left and i will say not a single one of them in the uh craig thing come close to matching sanchez except for the one from casino royale and there's only one in the brosnan one that goes above them so sanchez is always going to be one of my top 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 villains because he's just he's so good like he's just amazing i love him so i know blofeld is the main villain like it's more supposed to be for the whole series but because i'm walking into the earlier ones late i don't have a single blofeld in my top four because at this point i'm just like ah bond fights the villain of the year you know like I think some of these other characters are just more more engaging, more interesting. More, more engaging, definitely. Uh, Blofeld would be great if he was kept consistent and kept at a consistent level of seriousness. But Blofeld for me is sort of just like, eh, that's that's like early idea of Bond. You know? The Bond character has grown beyond Blofeld. It's Bond and Beyond. In space. It is kind of the thing where you have to judge Blofeld based off of which movie. Because if you judge Blofeld overall, you only live twice and Diamonds Are Forever and Free Hours only fucking ruin it. And then it's like, well, Blofeld's a jackass. In the first two movies, it's like, oh, Blofeld's. This guy's like uh, intimidating and everything. And then, yeah. <laughs> Although, as much as I've spoken about like not loving the more cheesiness i think the one where blofeld gets killed off might be my favorite intro (laughs) because it's just so ridiculous (laughs) mr bond mr bond (laughs) i'll buy you a delicatessen and stainless steel yeah (laughs) such a good line on the gadget side of things we got the manta ray disguise we got the felix lighter um the laser Polaroid camera, the exploding alarm clock, the dent night toothpaste, the signature rifle, the rake with the radio transmitter, and the cigarette packet, which is the detonator. Thumbs up on me. I love them. And specifically, I like the toothpaste being the plastique. Like, I think that's just such a nice cover up for an explosive like that. And of course, the main gadget being. The man right now. The, um, <laughs> I, I would like the Felix Slider. That's such a good tie-in for everything. I would say that the only one that really, I think, captures any sort of real interest or imagination is the the gun with this line to Bond's uh, handprint. And I don't think it's used enough in the movie. It's only used for one section of it. And I think most of the gadgets kind of fall into that category. So I'd probably uh, thumbs down on the gadgets for me. Now, if, go ahead. do they actually have guns? Like, I'm not a gun aficionado in any way. Do they have that kind of technology actually implemented in the real world? I would or assume or- this is the type of thing where it's like... It sounds stupid to say yes, but at the same time, like, they got some shit. Like, 
anybody, if you want to go down a rabbit hole, look at like interviews and different things from people that work at different companies that are, you know, like Lockheed Martin and whatever. Um, I wish I would have been old enough at this point. Uh, I was a little kid, but I know that, uh, long story short, blah, 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 blah. Uh, my grandfather was, uh, a police captain and he, he knew somebody who that worked at, uh, RCA and he had said before, he's like, you wouldn't believe the shit that we've got that you're not going to see for decades. So it's like, well, I wish I could be like, well, well, what is it? Like, you know, kind of a thing. Like, yeah, that's actually it's very interesting to me. Because it's like, there's people that do this kind of stuff. And it's like, well, what does that mean? Did you have like modern cell phones from 2020 in like 1980? Did you have like right now in 2021 is Elon Musk like, uh, you know, teleporting to the fucking moon or <laughs> like, you know, and it seems like it's ridiculous to say that. And people are like, oh, of course the government doesn't have that. But then it's like, then you find out eventually that a lot of these things are true. And then it's being, you know, con- tinfoil hat conspiracy thing. A couple decades go by and you go, ah, well, we, we, that, that was true. That happened. And then you go, well, then shit, you got to kind of, think twice about it so i wouldn't be surprised if this is a real thing but i can't imagine the practicality of it you know yeah so i'm going uh thumbs up and uh rob you're going thumbs up as well right yeah and then then calm's going thumbs down action and humor i think the humor is essentially a thumbs down because it's not a humorous movie and when the humor does kick in it's not good like it's out of place. It's weird. Yeah, yeah. we're all in agreement no, about that one. <laughs> yeah, no, very humorous movie. Really. Action though, thumbs up. I guess it kind of has to be, really. I mean, this is this is probably the most action y action movie of the Bond series so far. I would say, I I think that some of the the violence of the deaths is too much. It goes too far. Really? Yep. Yeah. I feel like. I feel like the Bond movie should try and be differentiating themselves in this era more than trying to just s- s- blend seamlessly into this diehard. Let those guys have their movies that way. We're a Bond franchise. We need to do things. We're a bit more, I don't want to say like class or tongue in cheek aspect of it as well, but it should be a bit more fam- family orientated. Cause even though Bond does all this, this crazy stuff and he's not exactly he's a family character or anything like that i feel the way they've done the movies in the past have been a bit more like you can still see the violence you can still be scared by it but it's not so in your face i feel this was getting to the point of like okay we need to go slightly further in the more serious direction then they decided that it was just going to be a part hammer horror movie as well the uh according to screen rant over the course of the two films that Dalton was in, he kills 20 people. Brosnan kills 34 in the next movie, <laughs> <laughs> which goes to show a difference in time. Like It's like they're not as brutal deaths, but there's more death yeah. and that kind of thing. I, I, yeah, I think that's kind of the, the balance that they should they strike more. Just like the deaths don't look as visceral. Like these deaths are going to be far more memorable than probably most of the deaths we're going to see in the next pretty much any movie going forward. But it's memorable in the way of like it'll give you nightmares type of death. There's one, and it's not in the next one, but there is one death upcoming that is my favorite overall, and I can't wait till we get to it. Which one is it? Don't spoil the the death, but what movie? World's Not Enough. Huh. Wouldn't think they would that one. I'm curious. Um. So. Shaken or stirred. Uh, I'm, I've said it before when we were going into this. Living Daylight's License to Kill and GoldenEye is my stretch of the three three of my favorite movies. Not that they're number one, number two, and number three, but you know what I mean. Like that's If I'm going to watch a block of three movies in a row, that's the block I'm watching. License to Kill is number one ranked for me at the moment. It doesn't stay that way. I do eventually uh, replace it with another one, if not two, but... License to Kill is always perpetually either my number two favorite Bond film or my number three. Uh, right now, I have it at number one. It 
won't stay there. I mean, you've been questioning it now. I just think it was such a, a good movie to watch, and it's definitely one that I will watch again. And by the way, I misspoke. It's not World's Not Enough. It's Tomorrow Never Dies. But the name of that oh. film <laughs> should be World's Not Enough because I think that fits better. Um, but yeah, I definitely shaken. Definitely one of the best Bond films. It's I, it's gonna be weird how this film stays in the memory for me. So, if you ask me, definitive shaken or stirred, it's a shaken movie. Like I said, there's only three movies that will only have stirred, and based on what we've got coming up, I assume that they'll be the only three movies that I'll have a severely negative reaction towards. Mm. So. Die another day. Uh, potentially <laughs> die another day. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I have I have seen Die Another Day. I don't feel like I was like repulsed by it, but I did watch it when I was a lot younger. So maybe yeah. now going into it, I'll I'll have that sort of reaction to it. But we'll see. Um, uh, well, never mind. I'll, we'll get there when we get there. But I currently have it. I currently have License to Kill ranked seven out of all the movies. Now you had it above Living Daylights when we started, but now it's under Living Daylights. It, it, it's cha- it's changed in the past week or so because I've had some time to think about it. So I originally had the Living Daylights above Moonraker as well, mm-hmm. and I've moved them both down. And I moved License to Kill down in the in the course of this thing because I just feel like even though they both have issues with me with the Dalton aspect of it. And I just think that the living daylights, I know Rob's saying like, this is the most consistent story. I feel like the living daylights is a more consistent story just because the last to kill, the thing that that got me the most annoyed about it was the fact that it's missing that bond versus MI6 aspect to it. And again, that may have made the movie a bit too long or bloated, but I feel like that was an interesting arc. They could have gone through in this movie that they just don't exploit. And it almost is like they added that scene in just so M could say the scene, say the name license to kill. You know what? You guys keep saying, well, it would have been more bloated. I disagree. I think it should, there should have been an element of that added in because these movies have been more bloated for much more ridiculous things. And, and I'll tell you one thing like that's it, really bloated in this Crest's head. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. <laughs> but I also feel like the title License to Kill, and it's based around the idea that Bond has his license to kill taken away and that. So it doesn't affect anything. It's not like he doesn't have... Because he takes his, he steals his gun, he takes that, so he still has that throughout. Or he uses other people's guns throughout the entire movie. He's got a specially crafted one made by Q Branch, given to him. So realistically, that scene doesn't have any influence on the movie. And that's what that's why it, it, it goes down for me under the living daylights. It's just one of those uh, he's a loose cannon cop on the edge. Kind of like mm. they just wanted to establish that he's a uh, loose cannon. Yeah. And so Oh go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that like it's one of those instances where like watching them, I know that these movies are technically better than a lot of the movies we've seen beforehand. Like the but the the whole action scenes look better the overall the stories are more crisp they've given more definition to the bond girls all that other stuff which i do appreciate and do like has gotten better but they leave me cold so it's almost like even though i put these movies above a lot of the other ones i probably would end up watching some of the ones that have got ranked below it more than i'm more willingly going to go back to the living daylights and license to kill they kind of feel like one and done movies to me it's your dichotomy of how i always say like uh the shawshank redemption is the best movie of all time but my favorite movie of all time is terminator 2 i can watch shawshank redemption anytime like back in the day when i used to just watch like regular tv where you know we don't have on demand and stuff if shawshank was on tbs because it was constantly on tbs then it was like yeah i could put on shawshank like i love watching shawshank and I think that Terminator 2 is a fantastic movie. It's one of the best action films that's ever existed. I think it's fundamentally just a very good movie, especially. And this is where we get into the whole, like, uh, how I said earlier, if you add the deleted scenes, if you have the DVD where you can type in August 29th, 1997 on the uh, the menu and get the full expanded version of Terminator 2, it is an even better movie by far. And you get scenes with Kyle Reese and Terminator 2 and stuff. It's just, oh God, I love that movie. But um, 
fundamentally, like, yeah, like I, I can recommend T2 to somebody in a different way than Shawshank and Godfather to me is my number two best movie of all time, but it's not my number two favorite movie of all time because my number two favorite would probably be something like Robin Hood Men in Tights. And yeah, fundamentally the Godfather is a better movie, <laughs> like, you know, kind of like, but it is easier to watch Robin Hood Men in Tights than that. So I, yeah, sometimes I'm in the mood and I'm like, you know, I really want to watch something goofy and I want to watch something more like, I think live and let die kind of. But I agree with you, like License to Kill, better movie, but you might not want to watch it all the time. So I want to put this out there because I don't think we've ever said this. The movies up to all of Brosnan's are on Pluto TV for free in case you you know do want to follow along and watch along with us. That's how you can watch these movies for free. Pluto TV. Why only uh, up to Brosnan? Do you know? Probably just because the Craig films are more recent, so they're going to mm. try they're to... They're on Netflix and stuff. Yeah. And I don't know where Wait. they are right now. I think they might be Netflix. I own all the DVDs, so... I thought yeah. they were Hulu. I think they're Hulu. See, I've been, um, I've been watching them through Amazon Prime. And that's... Uh, again, it's, it, it costs on each one. I've been renting all of them for about... It's only like three fifty, so it's probably like five dollars to rent them for one episode, one movie at a time. So they're on Amazon Prime. So that probably means that they're not on Netflix then. No, yeah. no, the other ones aren't on Netflix. I would have checked all of those ones. Yeah. I think I think some of the Craig ones are. Hmm. I'd have to double check, but I think some of them are. They were on YouTube, some of them, but I don't know if they were free on YouTube or not. They wouldn't have been, I imagine. Yeah, probably not. But hopefully other people are, I know Nikolai has been um, following this podcast. Thank you, Nikolai. And I know that some other people have been popping in here and there. I don't know if everybody's doing it like kind of per movie or if anybody's checking him out as we go along. If we are, or if you are, uh, tell us, you know, what are you thinking about? Like uh, following this whole thing and, and going along with this because it's, it is a ride to go through 24 movies that are spanning decades and decades and different cultures and different, again, like we're in the eighties for this one for this like lethal weapon type of style. And however many weeks ago it was, we were talking about like, well, things are different in Goldfinger, and you know, like it, it feels like it's, you're getting a rush of this sort of big change kind of thing. If you look back on some of the clips of the old ones, do you guys have kind of like whiplash? <laughs> yeah, it's it's a completely different time and, and series in a way. Even though they are together, it feels like a completely different series. Mm. You won't hear things like "Fetch my shoes," for example. You know, it's like wow, we've come a long way from Doctor No. And like a uh, dink getting slapped on the butt, being told to leave because it's. Men are talking, men, 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 kind men of thing. Talking, you know, like. yeah, I think it's been more jarring in the most, um, in the, in the most recent example, from Moore to Dawn, because the rest of them, even though Moore is obviously very different to what Connery and Lazenby was uh, presented as, you do get the sense that there was a bit of progression and evolution there, whereas this one, it kind of feels like it just takes a bit of a left, like just a huge diversion. I will say, back with a uh, with a Brosnan sit somewhere in the middle. Uh, visually, I think the jump from Dalton to Brosnan is the most natural. Like, they look like they could relatively be playing the same part. Whereas, like, when we get Dalton after more, it feels like, yeah, it's a completely different guy. And we are up for some other big changes to the series coming up next. But before we talk about those, we need to just round things out with some plugs. I mentioned before, if you want to show us some support and you want to help this podcast and the channel and the website grow, patreon.com slash fanboys anonymous is the best way to do that. But also if you're subscribed and you're leaving your comments and you're liking the posts and you're sharing them, that all goes a long way as well. Merch shops are Public and Redbubble. You should find that link below in the description as well. If you are interested in the pro wrestling side of things, smartcoutmoment.com is where you'll hear our stuff on that spectrum. 
And of course, like and share and favorite and subscribe and follow and do all that kind of stuff. Hit up the Patreon for that as well. And you can follow me at Tony Mango on social media. And you can follow these guys on what they've got going on as well in their social medias and their other projects. Rob? Yeah, you can. If you do like the pro wrestling side of things, you can check out everything going on at Fightful.com and Fightful Select. At this point, we should be on the road to money in the bank. Am I right on that, Tony? So I think that, so we're recording this on April 18th and I'm pretty sure that this one will come out on the 21st of May or the 14th of May, maybe. So we're we're definitely in money in the bank territory. So check out everything going on with that. That's usually one of the better events of the year. You can follow me on Twitter and everywhere else really at dude Felice. And yeah, thank you for your support. And Keep checking fanboys for more great content. So you can follow me on Twitter at Wigmeister14. Check out smartcamoment.com, all the articles that are going on there on a weekly basis. I contribute the power rankings. So if you want to know what wrestlers are top and bottom of the rankings for every single week, then that's where you tune in to check those out. Uh, And also, if you're interested in some retro wrestling content, then make sure you're listening to... 2001 Wrestling Odyssey and the Paul Heyman Smackdown podcast in the Small Camera Moment YouTube channel or podcast feed archives. And that's going to do us in for this edition. So we thank you for listening to this and thank you for suspending your license to kill and dropping your comments below. And we bless your hearts. That's what basically what I need to say here. But James Bond and the Review to a Kill podcast is going to return with Goldeneye.